What's up guys, welcome to your 35th Java tutorial, and in this tutorial I'm going to show you guys how to make a variable length argument list. Now I showed you guys how to build methods using uh, multi-dimensional arrays and also how to build basic methods, but each time you did, you needed to tell it what arguments it took. But sometimes you want to build a method and you don't know how many arguments it took. So for example, say you want to build a method to average a bunch of numbers. Well, maybe you don't know how many numbers you want to average first, so you don't know how many arguments to give it. Well, in this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how to make a method that takes um, however many arguments you want. So let's go ahead and build a method outside our main method. Uh, let's build a public static int, since it's going to be returning integers, average. And I just named it average. You can name it whatever you want. Now, go ahead, and it's going to take an argument of integers but you don't know how many so anytime you don't know how many what you do is put an ellipse and that's three dots and then put the name of the variable you want to use and instead of putting int x and y and z you just put three dots and what three dots means is alright I'm gonna be throwing numbers in here but I don't know if I'm gonna be throwing two numbers five numbers or five hundred numbers so dot 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 means just do it and I'm not gonna tell you how many numbers so now that we have that, that's a new thing uh, I wanted to show you in this tutorial. Dot 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 means you don't know how many arguments it's going to take. Let's go ahead and build a simple function. Let's just total um, all these numbers so it starts at zero since we don't have any numbers yet. Uh, let's make an enhanced for loop. Um, set our variable equal to x and it takes numbers in it. And let's just add all those numbers to the total so total plus equals x so it's going to loop through all those numbers and add them all to the total so now after that we just need to return um, the average so return total over numbers the length so what this does if you threw uh, five numbers in here it's going to return total divided by five if you only threw um, three numbers in here it's going to return that total divided by three so number, which should actually be numbers, is what you passed in with, and the length of it is how many values. So that's how that works. So this is our method we just built. Now we need a way to output it on the screen. So go back to your main function so you can run this program, and just write system out, move my mouse, print line, and let's just print something like, um, average and then in here in your average method you can type however many numbers you want 43 56 76 and 8 and let me go ahead and run this and show you guys the average of this is 45 so that took um four arguments or four numbers right there but let's say we wanted to add more 65 76 2 and 31 let's go ahead and run this does it still work yep interestingly enough the average is only 44 for this hmm, interesting so this is what this does anytime you want to build a method this is the meat of this tutorial right here anytime you want to build a method that you don't know how many arguments it's going to take so for example we pass like four the first time and eight the second time what you want to do is put what type it is the ellipse and then you just give yourself a variable that you can work with in your method so again that ellipse right there means I don't know how many it is so I don't have to make it over and over again so again we just built the method right there and called it in our main function right there so that's your quick tutorial on how to make a variable length argument list in methods that you build so you don't have to write um, a new method each time you want to enter a different number of arguments um, so practice that and once you uh, play with it a couple times you'll get good at it so thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe to my channel and don't forget I'm gonna have uh, this video able for free download so make sure you do that if you want so thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next tutorial so guys welcome to your 36th Java tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to show you guys how to build a time class now what a time class is is it's pretty much a separate class that has a bunch of different time functions and I'm gonna allow the user to enter three numbers one for the hour minute and seconds and it's gonna convert that into military time and regular time 
and we're going to be needing this um, information for the next couple tutorials so make sure you build this with me so first let's go ahead in our tuna class right here make sure you're outside your main class and I'm going to go ahead and build three variables and they're going to be private variables so not private private same thing right and uh, make sure they're integer variables one for hour and another one for minute and another one for second so I just copy that because I'm lazy and turn this one a minute and turn this one a second so now we got three private variables but now they have no value so what we want to do is give them a value and we're going to do that by letting the user input the numbers so let's go ahead and make a method to do this so public void since it's not going to return anything and just name it set time or you can name it anything you want but this is also going to take three arguments in h for hour int m for minute and in s for second so it's going to take three arguments but we just don't want to let them enter any number they want since the hour has to be between 0 and 24 the minute has to be between 0 and 60 since that's how many minutes there are an hour and the seconds also have to be between 0 and 60 so what we're going to do is check this data before we enter it so let's put hour is equal to and instead of just h let's go ahead and check it so let's go ahead and write um, let's just do this wow would you look at that if hour is less than or equal to 0 and you have to make an and because it needs to meet two conditions and my ampersand is on 7 I put a bunch of stickers on my keyboard for After Effects so now I can't see any of my symbols I have to look at my um, uh, laptop for it so and now if hour is less than 24 so if it's between 0 what the heck just happened there I have caps lock on or something no nope. just a funky little thing uh, alright now hour is less than 24 there we go we messed up that time so if these two conditions are met and the question mark are these two conditions met then hour if not zero and why is this little green bar right here there we go must have been something with my screen recorder so here's what we're saying right now if hour is greater than zero and it's less than 24 then you can go ahead and use that number if it's not then go ahead and by default just put zero so we don't mess up our whole program just because they entered a wrong number so now we need to do this for minute and second so let's go ahead and change minutes and change this to m and change this to m and this to m and then go to guess what we're going to do next second and change this to s and this to s and this to s and make sure this hms uh, matches whatever you put up here and now don't forget to do this instead of 24 go ahead and change these to 60 I know you gotta change all this it probably would have been faster just to type it by hand but well we didn't so too bad so now that we got them to enter a time and what this is gonna do when we call this method right here they're gonna enter three numbers as arguments so what we want to do is we pretty much set the time right there but we have no way to display it yet so the first way I'm going to display it is through military time. So and that's the time where you don't you can use like um 12 to 24. So you'll see what it is later. So public string since it's going to return a string since it's going to display something obviously to make sure I had to spell military right and it's going to take no arguments since it's just going to display and in the body I'm going to return string format and remember our format takes two arguments oh they already put them in for us how kind delete those kind but not kind enough would you fill in the rest of it for us it's gonna take and remember in here you need to put percent and where's my percent sign above the five o two d colon percent o two d colon percent o two d make sure I got that right and what this is going to do is display the first one in two decimal places and then add a colon display the second number at two decimal places then add a colon and display the seconds at two decimal places and after that let's just go ahead and add what we want to put in hour minute 
second and now that they're set right here we can display them down here so now just add a colon after that and now we built everything we needed to so now we can go to our main apples method right here or apples class excuse me and we can begin building our objects since this was the tuna class we need a tuna object for that so tuna tuna object and remember you need an object so you can use the crap inside the class so equal new tuna and first let's just go ahead and even though we didn't set a time yet we can go ahead and display the military time just to see what it has for default so system out and let's just go ahead and print line and put tuna object to what was it to military there we go to military and so we didn't set a time yet so whenever we run this make sure I don't have any X's anywhere it should give us all zeros by default so yeah save those and look at that by default we get all zeros right here so now now that I lost my screen recorder oh man hopefully it's somewhere in there whenever I uh, run this program my screen recorder goes behind my Java so I have no idea what's going on right now oh oh well anyways that's really annoying but anyways let's go ahead and set the time now so tuna hopefully you guys can see this object and now we can go ahead and press set time and of course this is going to take three arguments and let's go ahead and press something like um, 13 for hour and 27 for minutes and 6 for seconds and now once you run this system out well we can just go ahead and copy this since we're lazy copy once after we set it we can go ahead and run this again and hopefully if I don't have any errors we can go ahead and see right here the first one was zero that was before we set the time and the second one when we set the time right here 13 27 6 what that did is converted it all to military time and now I can see my screen recorder but still behind so now dude my screen recorder is messing up gotta remember fix that somehow so now let me show you guys what we did in our set time 13 27 and 6 we went right here pass these in right here 13 27 and 6 it checked if 13 was between this it was we checked if 27 was between this and 6 was between this since it was it used all the values and set them in the hour minute and second and that was when we put print to military which was pretty much a display method it pretty much just put them in this format and displayed them out to us as you can see here so in the next tutorial I'm going to be showing you how to use not military time regular American time or I don't know what it's called just regular time I guess so um thank you for watching in the next tutorial you definitely want to watch because we're going to need that information probably for the next couple of few tutorials so again, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up, guys? Welcome to your 37th Java tutorial. And in this tutorial, I'm going to be showing you guys how to use our time class to convert time to a regular string instead of military time. Since, you know, not everyone uses military time. Some people just use normal time, like um, 1.30 p.m. So let's just go ahead, and I'm going to show you guys how to do that. So we first need to make another method, and I'm going to name mine public, but I'm going to spell it right, eventually. There we go, right there. You got it, buddy. Public string, and let's just name it to string, since this is just a normal string. You can name it like to normal or something if you want, but you know what? I don't. So I'm going to name mine to string, and now we got a new method built. And what we want to do here is just return a basic formatting string. So let's go ahead and return string, just like last time. Move my cursor out of the way. Format. Why am I not typing right today? And now, once we do that, it's going to let us format this string how we want it. So the first thing that we need to do is, let me make sure I don't got anything messed up. String format. Looks good. First thing we need to do is give the format we want to put our time in. So for the first one for the hour, we just want percent %d. 
for the uh, minute we want percent O two D. So percent zero two D. And this is because the minute always has two decimal places. For the second, it's the same one. Percent O two D or zero two D. Excuse me. And for the AM or PM, we just want a string since it's just letters. So now for the hour, we need to do something weird. We need to check if it's 0 or 12, then put 12. If not, then put the, well, you'll see what we do. So in here, go ahead and in your, uh, well, just do as I type. If hour is exactly equal to 0, or if hour is exactly equal to 12, then what do we want to do? Well, let's just go ahead and put 12 for that. If not, else, if it isn't, then just go ahead and put our modulus 12. Let me go slide this over a little bit. Maybe that'll be easier for you guys. So what we're doing here is saying, all right, if that if they put 0 or 12 for the hour, then go ahead and put 12. If they put anything else, then divide it by 12 and give our remainder. So if it's 13, put 1. If it's 8, put 8. If it's 14, put 2. Simple enough. The, the other ones are uh, a lot easier, I promise. For minute, we just need to go ahead and type minute, since we don't need to do anything special with that. Second, just go ahead and type second, since minutes and seconds don't have AM or PM, only um, hours do. So now it brings us to my last point. We need to check whether it's AM or PM they're talking about. And there we go, right there. So how do we check if it's AM or PM? Well, we need to test the hour, first of all. And if hour is less than 12, then what do we want to do? We want to go ahead and insert AM. Else, if it's not, let's go ahead and insert PM. So that's how we check for AM or PM right there. So now we got our basic two string, and we got a little error right there. And I forgot parentheses somewhere right here. I'll find it. I promise I will. I think I did. Oh, crap, this darn screen recorder is in the way. Uh, let me pause this. I'll here we go. This was the one I forgot right here. Again, when you're doing your hour, make sure this one's enclosed right here and make sure the entire thing is enclosed right there. But anyways, hopefully I don't have any more errors. Now that we got our basic string to string method built, we can go ahead and call it in our main function. So let's just go ahead and right here we called the military one and we can go ahead and copy this and we're not going to use it again I'm just too lazy to type to string so the first one's going to call the military time and the second one's going to call the string one that we just built and by default this is 0 and by default this is 12 and if you're saying alright why isn't this 0 and why is it 12 well I'll show you right here and right here where we put if hour is 0 or 12 then put 12 and it was 0 so it put 12 since when you're looking at regular time uh, there's only 12 o'clock and then it goes right to 1 o'clock there is no um, 0 o'clock I don't know if you guys knew that or not but uh yeah jot that in your notebooks there's actually no 0 o'clock so now let's go ahead and quit messing around this crap and do what we came here for we want to be able to set the time so let's go ahead and put tuna actually we probably want to put tuna object and let's go ahead and use our set time function and we want to enter enter three parameters the hour and we'll go ahead and change that to 13 which should be one o'clock in regular time and then for minutes we'll put like 27 and then for the seconds we'll put like six or something then go ahead and add a colon and now we can go ahead and output these two again and why type them again if you can just copy and paste them the lazy way that's right that's what I'm talking about and now let's just go ahead and um well let's just go ahead and output it simple as that so here's what we got here's our de defaults that we got from last time before we set the time and then we set the time in military time it was 13 o'clock I don't even 1300 hours 27 6 seconds in regular time it is 1 o'clock or 127 and 6 seconds p.m. so that is how you use here let me recap this one more time what we did is we pretty much just outputted the defaults on the screen then we went ahead and called set time passing the parameters 13 27 and 6 
So it th took 13 hours and converted it to hours. Uh, what was the next one? 27 and stored it for minutes, and 6 and stored it for seconds. It outputted that in our military format, and then it outputted that in our regular string format. So that is your basics of your time class right there. And make sure that you uh, copy all this and follow along with me because in the next tutorials, I'm going to be teaching you uh, new stuff. Not about time, but we're going to be using uh, this code right here. So make sure you copy all this and make sure your programs are working. And if they aren't, then leave a comment on this video and I'll try to answer it for you. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I hope you learned a little something, but not too much. And I will see you next time. What's up guys, welcome to your 38th Java tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to show you guys how to control access to different variables in other classes and also what the this uh, keyword means in well, Java. So uh, let's first of all talk about access to these private variables right here. Now what private means is that these variables are private meaning that only these methods have access to it. Only these methods in the same class, this tuna class, can use these variables. So what if we try to use these private variables in another class like our apples one? Well, let's go ahead and try to do that right now. First of all, we already made a tuna object to use all the stuff in that class. But let's go ahead and try to use something like hour right here. If we go ahead and try to use hour and change it to like another number, we get this little um, error right here and if we were to run this we'd get a compilation error so I don't want to do that so what it says is the field tuna hour is not visible and that is because instead of public it is private again meaning that only these methods right here can use it so if we want to change that and put it so these variables can be used in any class outside we need to change that to public and now you can see my little x went away so now I can use a class outside to change the variables in another class. So let's go ahead and change it back to private. And make sure you spell it right. That's kind of important. And go ahead and delete this. And that brings me to another point. What the this keyword is in Java. So what if you're saying that, all right, I got three variables in this class named hour, minute, and second. But also, in my constructor, and or this doesn't even matter, it can be your constructor or just another function, or excuse me, method. I mean, uh, talking about C++ for too long. Change these to hour, minute, and second. So now, we probably need to change these too, don't you think? Minute and second. So what if we were to say that these variables in this method inside this class were the exact same as these variables right here so in other words if the constructor or any other method uses names or variables identical to instance variables then what when you run the program what's it gonna do well let's go ahead and see right now um, I guess we don't need this anymore but we'll keep it anyways let's go ahead and run this and as you can see, we get one, two, three, one, two, three, and then we set the time, which doesn't matter anymore. Then we get one, two, three, one, two, three. So my point is that is this: any time you have the same variables in a method or a constructor, which are the same thing, um, you Java looks to these variables, the local variables, instead of these right here. So if we're saying, all right, that's good and all. And by the way, you should never name these variables the same as this. This is just uh, for knowledge, but um, anyways. So what if we want to use that these variables, the 4, 5, and 6 instead? Well, if a method contains a local variable with the same name as the field names right here, then the method is always going to look at the local variables instead. It's always going to look at these instead and that is there is only one way to kind of overpower this and that is to use the this reference to refer to these variables instead so for example you know we had one two three one two three one two three one two three 
Well, if we use a little keyword called this instead, then it's going to refer to these variables. So this hour, this minute, and this second. And this pretty much means this method right here that we're talking about. So anytime you use this, it says, all right, don't use all these. Use this right here. And I'm sure that's a tone when he was creating this. Use this one right here. I'm sure he said that. So now if we go in our main apples program and go ahead and run it, we now get one, two, three, one, two, three, before, uh oh, oh, four, five, six, four, five, six. So that is using these local uh, variables instead of these private ones right here. So again, anytime you want to use the variables in your method, instead of the variables outside your method, if they're named the same thing, you need to use the this keyword. And that says, all right, use these ones right here or use this ones, not here, that doesn't even make sense, but you know what I mean. Use them locally instead of far apart. So again, it's easier just to see and play around with it. And once you do, you're gonna understand what this means. Wow, that's like a little joke. And anyways, uh, hope you understand at least a little bit. In the next tutorials, I promise I'll be clearing this up for you. It's kinda confusing right now, but um, uh, keep an eye out for my next tutorials. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up guys, welcome to your 39th Java tutorial. And in this tutorial, I'm gonna be talking about overloaded constructors. Now, you guys already know what a constructor is. It's pretty much a method with the same name as that class. And whenever you create an object, it automatically calls that method or does that method. So, I told you guys how to build a constructor, and I told you guys that you can build only one constructor with the same name as the class. But I didn't tell you guys that you can build multiple constructors. And depending how many arguments you have, it picks what constructor to use. For example, if you called that object with one argument, it would have a constructor for that. If you called that um, object with three arguments, it would have a constructor that took three arguments. So let's go ahead and do this right now. So we first need our three variables, private int hour, and then we need that same thing. Uh, let me put a semicolon instead of colon. We need that same um, variable with minute and second minutes and second now let's go ahead and build our first constructor and we do this by putting public tuna since tuna is the name of the class and I'm not gonna have any arguments for this one we're gonna do one with zero arguments one two and three so when you put one with zero arguments what we want to do is eventually we want to give it three arguments so what we do is put this keyword and what this does was is pretty much invoke the constructor again but give it three arguments this time using zero zero and zero so now we need to build another constructor so public actually we can probably just copy this copy we're lazy and paste public tuna but instead of zero arguments this one if they pass in one argument what are we gonna do well if they pass in one number then let's just assume it's the hour. So we put this hour, so if they passed in um, object five, it's gonna be five o'clock, then zero, zero. So now let's build another one, and this one's gonna have two arguments. This one's gonna have an hour and a minute. So int hour and int minute right there. So now what we wanna do is invoke hour and minute, and again, what this is gonna do is call this constructor again but pass it three arguments right here so now I've seen alright if we call this constructor again it's gonna look through this one see where there's three arguments look through this one see where there's three arguments and look through this one see where there's three arguments and that's why I'm getting an X right here it says the constructor tuna it, 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 is not defined because we keep calling a constructor with three arguments but we didn't build one yet so let's go ahead and build one right now Let's go ahead and put public tuna, and I could have copied that, but int hour, int minute, int second. And if you watch, all of my x's just disappeared. So you see they're now up, and then once we finally build one, it disappears. So now that we have a constructor 
with three arguments we can go ahead and build something what it does in fact I'm gonna build another I'm gonna have it call another method right here that sets the time to hour minutes and seconds and we're actually going to be building this in the next tutorial actually we can probably build it right now we have enough time but let me explain to you first what this one does if a user was to create an object with zero arguments it would give it three arguments by default so it can go down here to this constructor if a user was to enter an object with two arguments it would go to this one it would use the first number as the hour the second one is minute and the third one is zero and then it would call this constructor again with three arguments and the only one with three arguments is this in hour in minute is second and then what this constructor does is set the time in a set time method and you're saying alright where the f is that method well we're gonna build it right now so take it easy let's go public void set time and as the arguments again what we want to do is take three parameters in h int m for minute and int s for seconds now in the body scroll up a little bit there we go not bad in the body what do we want to have to set the time well actually we're going to be building three um, methods for this as well and I know it gets confusing but set hour and this is going to take an hour set minute and this is going to take a minute and set a second and this is going to take a second parameter and now once you close this it says um, the method set minute is undefined and we're actually going to build three I mean let's see six more methods I think um, we're going to build methods for setting each of the times and why do we need a new method for set hour a new method for set minute and set second well we can't just have any hour they type in um, we need to build a method for it like last time where we set the hour we had to check if it was between 0 and 23 or 24 and set minute we need to make sure this is between 0 and 60 and also for set seconds and we're also going to make, make another method for get method I mean uh, not get method for get hour get minute and get seconds and that's just going to return everything but we're going to be doing that next tutorial but if you don't still don't know why um, I'm having se separate methods for these it's so only these methods can access the hour and down here as I said in the last time we don't want any other class to have access to this information right here so that's why we need to build a separate set and get methods for each hour in um, like hour minute and second but anyways that was supposed to be for next tutorial that was just a little jump ahead the meat of this tutorial that I want to tell you is right here um let's see yep these are all constructors right here one with zero arguments one with one two and three and I just want to tell you that you can build different constructors depending on how many arguments you have that way um, you don't really need the user to enter one specific set of information it varies and then depending on how much information they entered it does a certain task so um, if you don't understand this I promise in the next um, either one or two tutorials this will make all sense once we finally build our program and you can see what's going on but thank you guys for watching make sure to write this code right now and again like I said by the end of these tutorials you're gonna understand why we did it and how this all works but for now thank you guys for watching my tutorial on overload constructors don't forget to subscribe to my channel it is the best channel ever again thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time so guys welcome to your 40th Java tutorial and in this tutorial we're gonna be building the set hour set minute and set seconds methods now we already um, got the data from them, the data that we need in the last tutorial, so hopefully you watched that because you need this code anyways. But if you did and typed everything up, then that's good, you're good to go. So let's go ahead and build first the set hour function, or excuse me, method. It's the same thing as a function pretty much. I just spent uh, around C++ all day, so anyways. Public void since it doesn't return anything, and set hour 
And what argument does this take? In H. It takes just the hour, since again, we're only setting an hour, nothing else. Now, in this, what we want to do is check if the data is between 0 and 24. And if it is, it's valid. If not, we're just going to set it to default like 0 or something. And by, or something I mean 0. So, let's take that hour, and first, let's make a simple if statement. Is the hour greater or equal to 0? And, where's my and? 7, right there. Again, I put stickers on my keyboard, so it's kind of annoying. And, is the hour less than 24? You're going to say, alright, if that is true, then you can go ahead and use the hour. Else, if it's not true, go ahead and put zero. So, again, this is a conditional expression, or um, it's pretty much just the same as an if statement. What this is going to do is check if that hour is between zero and pretty much make sure the hour is greater than zero and less than 24. And if it is, use it. If not, use zero. So now do the same thing for minute and second, except when we use this, um, we want to change our minute and second, and we also want to change this minute and second, and we also want to change this minute, and don't use a capital, and second, and also want to change this minute minute second second and instead of having let me check this data real quick and minute 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 instead of having 24 you want to change these to 60 since with minutes and seconds it doesn't need to be between 0 and 24 it needs to be between 0 and 60 so that's why we do that so now that we got our hour minute and second built what's this say right here Duplicate method, second hour, and type two. That's good. We're good to go. Um, hour, minute, second. What we need to do, this is what it was saying right here. Set minute and set second. So then, now that we got our check for hours, our check for minute, and check for second, what we can do now is write get methods just to get them. Since we write a set method to change data if need be if it's bad and we need a get method to pretty much when we're retrieving our data um, this is what we need this method for so let's go ahead and write public int and the first one we want is get hour so get hour and this is going to take no parameters and what it's going to do is this is the easiest thing you'll do all day get return hour right there so what this is going to do is pretty much take this and return it. So let's copy this and keep up with me because it's going to be a little too easy. Get minutes. And this one's going to return minute. And get second. And this one's going to return second. So now that we have f uh, three set statements and three get methods, I mean, uh, set methods get methods we need one more method and I promise this is the last one the last method that we need is pretty much just a formatting method and this pretty much just spits it all out or a display method so like last time I'm gonna put public string since this is gonna return a string and after string I'm just gonna name it I'll put like to to military time, so it'll do military time. Military time is a lot easier than normal time. And this isn't going to take any parameter since it's just going to return a string. So, what we want to return is let's go ahead and re string format. And again, it tells us we need two arguments. And the first argument is let me get rid of this, it annoys me. The first argument is how we want to format. So, we want to format. Percent zero two D percent zero two D colon percent zero two D. So percent zero two D percent zero two D percent zero two D. And this means the hour, the minute, and the second is each gonna have two decimal places. So for the first one, for the hour, it says what number do you want to use? 
Well, we want to use whatever number what was returned in our get hour method right there. For our second one, for our minutes, we want to use whatever was returned in our get minute method right there. And for our last one, of course, get second right there. So now these functions, let me double check this, make sure it's good. These functions are good to go. We built all the methods that we need. And again, whenever I say functions, I really mean methods. I'm just uh, just another language. Those methods are all we need. So now we can go in our main apples class right here, and we can begin building our objects. Now again, whenever we're going to go ahead and create four different objects because we had four different constructors. And actually, I'm going to be doing that in the next tutorial. So as you can see, we have one constructor, two one two three four so in the next tutorial I'm going to be building four different objects each to use these constructors in four different ways and then I'm going to be summing up and telling you how this whole program works and actually what the heck we just did and then you're going to understand it awesomely so thank you guys for watching it. don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next tutorial what's up guys welcome to your 41st job tutorial and in this tutorial, as promised, I'm going to be building four different uh, objects. And these objects are going to use this tune class. And depending on how much information they have them, they're going to use a different constructor for each one. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So let's get some spacing right there so you can see it good. Adjust my headphone and bam, I'm good to go. So in order to make objects, let's go ahead and name this tuna object and we'll set uh, this one equal to new tuna and this isn't going to take any arguments at all so if we go look in our tuna class right here and you know that it has no arguments because nothing's in here we look at which one of these constructors has no arguments well this one has an hour this one has an hour and a minute that's two numbers this one has three numbers but this one right here has no arguments right here so what it's going to do is insert three arguments and call this constructor again so then it's gonna go down here where this one takes zero 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 it's gonna set the time to zero 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 and then set the hour to zero and meant to zero and second to zero so now that we have that let's go ahead and build some more objects but this time let's give them different parameters or different arguments so let's go ahead and copy this and paste 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 and we'll name this tuna object two three and four and we'll give this one tuna object two we'll give it one parameter we'll give it an hour of five we'll give tuna object three two parameters we'll give it an hour of five and a minute of thirteen and we'll give tuna object four an hour of five minute of thirteen and seconds of like forty three or something so for example this one right here it has two arguments so it's gonna look at this constructor right here is this constructor good for me no this has zero arguments and I got two so I'm not using you what about can th is this constructor good for me well I got two numbers and this one only lets me insert one so uh uh I ain't using you what about this one well this has three and I only got two so I don't think so oh bam the last one's just right I got two, you got two, let's use it baby. So that pretty much uh, what happens with these objects. That's what's going on right now. But now that we got these objects, let's go ahead and actually use them. And so let's just go ahead and print out the time. So system out printf, we'll just do a simple print format. And again, this takes two arguments. The first argument is how you wanna format it and I want to format it and since we're going to be using um, this right here sh public string to military this returns a string so we probably want to put a uh, percent string with a new line right there and actually new line goes this way I believe that would have been embarrassing and so this one returns a string so now we can use our tuna object and then put something like two military with no arguments and what this is going to do is it is going to return our tuna object with no arguments right here so let's go ahead and you might as well do the other ones right now while we got this nice and copied uh... this is tuna object 
two, three, and four. Now let me run this and make sure I don't have any errors. And hopefully it runs right. And bam, look at this. Now the first one was object, uh, it was just tuna object and we didn't enter any parameters. The second one, we entered a five for the hour and it filled in zero for the rest. The second one we entered a five for hour and 13 for minute and it filled in the rest to zero. And this uh, last one, tuna object four, it filled in all of them for us. Or actually we did it ourselves. So let me see if I can position this right since my screen recorder is messing up again. And now let me go through one of these and show you guys exactly what a dud. Not dud. Why the heck did I say that? So anyways, let's just pick one that you can understand easy. And how about tune object 3? Right here, we made an object that had two parameters. Right here. 5 and 13. So it went to tuna where it creates everything and it went to our constructors and it says alright which one of these constructors has two arguments this one has two arguments right here so I'm gonna use this one this one has 0 1 and 3 so I'm gonna use this one that has 2 well what it did was plugged in what was our numbers 5 and 13 it used the 5 for hour the 13 for minute and it used the default of 0 and it called this constructor again but this time it used its three new numbers so whenever you use the three numbers it it uses this constructor right here and what this constructor does is set time it calls the set time method so now it says alright I'm gonna send you to the set time method so let's scroll down and see what the set time method tells us to do well it tells us to do three more methods right here set hour was pretty much check if it was between 0 and 24 which it was it was 15 I mean 5 set minute check if it was between 0 and 60 which it was and set second that was that 0 it plugged in for us um, that we didn't have to do anything for that so then we said alright we're good there so then when we finally called um, the two military uh, method what did it do well, it pretty much just said, all right, we want to use this method for that object right here. So what we're going to do is get that hour, which was 5, get that minute, which was 13, get that second, which was 0 by default, and I'm just going to return them all to you in a nice, pretty-looking string format right here. So that is why whenever we called this to military, it just outputted the string right down here. 5130. So that is, of course, um, a very complicated way, but again, you need to know it on how you can use overloaded constructors to, let me scroll down here, to make a bunch of different constructors based on how much information you enter. And in that example I just told you, since we entered two, it picked this constructor. And that is how you can pretty much. Um, use different objects with different amounts of information in it. So um, this will be clear when we be when pretty much we're building um, more programs. And this was just an example, so it might be a little fuzzy right now, but you'll understand eventually in the next couple of tutorials. So thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you understand at least the basics of overloaded constructors and how they are useful when creating objects with different argument links. So again, thank you guys for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and I will see you next tutorial. What's up people, welcome to your 42nd Java tutorial, and in this tutorial, I'm going to be going over a built-in method that Java has, it's called the toString method, and I'm going to show you guys what it is and why it's useful. And we're also going to be building part of a bigger program, um, this is probably going to be a two-part tutorial, so um, pay attention and it's going to be sweet. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is get three um, variables and they're all going to be private and they're going to be month, day, and year. So private int month and just go ahead and copy and paste that. Take advantage of our laziness. Control V, Control V, int day and private int year. So now we have three variables right there. So let's go ahead and do something with them. The first thing that we're going to want to do is build this pot pie. Again, you can see him on the pot pie class. So I'm going to build the pot pie constructor. 
So go ahead, public, and just go pot pie. And it's going to take three arguments. It's going to take int m for month, int d for day, and int y for year. Again, you can name these anything you want, not important. But remember to set your variables, which were your private variables, like month, equal to whatever you uh, corresponding letter. I just put MD and Y for obvious reasons. So that private day variable is going to be set to whatever we pass in for D. And that private Y is going to be set to whatever we pass in for Y. So now we got our constructor, but we want our constructor to do one more thing. We want it to print out a string. So, and we just want it to uh, print out so it can know, so we can know that our constructor worked or didn't work. Make sure you put an equal sign right there. So let's go ahead and system out printf. We can just uh, print format. And I already started filling them in for us. So let's go ahead and print out a string. So let's put, um, come on, Haas. Let's put the structure. Make sure you spell it wrong. For this is, and then we'll go ahead and put percent %s and that means string and then go ahead and put a new line if you feel like it if you don't feel like it you know you don't gotta and now as you can see right here our C style format it takes one string um, argument so in our second argument just go ahead and write this and when we write this what it means is this the keyword this what's highlighted right now this is just a reference to whatever object we just built whenever we call this class so it's gonna say alright then what the heck do you want me to put for a string well that's what we're gonna be going over in this tutorial right now anytime that you need a string representation of an object Java built this thing called a two string method so let's go ahead and write public and we're gonna be building that right now public string to string and I know most of, most of the time you can call your methods anything you want but you can't you have to say to string in this case and go ahead and it takes empty parameters and in your body of your method go ahead and return whatever format you want so return string format and then go ahead and percent go ahead and percent WTF does that mean go ahead and put this um, I mean you can write it in whatever format you want but uh, just follow along percent D percent D percent D that's the common date format um, and that has the month day and year so the month slash day slash year slash so this is what this is going to do well let's go ahead and uh, finish our tutorial and then you can probably see what it's going to do then I'll talk you through it one more time what we need to do is go ahead and create an object now and I'll call it pot pie and I'll just call it like something like pot object that pot object is not important you can name it whatever new pot pie and I know I should have like proper months and days and years but I should have four five six six seems like a good year a long time ago so now that we go ahead and create this object we should get a nice little string at the end if I didn't mess anything up and it says the constructor for this is 456 so now let me take you guys through exactly what I did what I did is create an object using the parameters 456 so let's go ahead and look what happened when I created the object it said alright since the first thing I'm going to do is this constructor, I'm going to pass the parameters 4, 5, and 6. And for month was equal to 4, day was equal to 5, and year was equal, equal to 6. What the constructor also did is say, alright, every time I create an object, I want you to print out this string. But we had in the string variable, instead of an actual string, we had a reference to an object and anytime you reference an object and it needs something in the string format it looks to this method right here what this method says is anytime you need a string representation of this object 
you look to me I'm two string I'm built in Java that's what I'm for so that's why it outputted this right here the constructor for this is 456 this is where that format 456 comes from right here and in the next tutorial if this seems uh, kinda confusing I'll show you guys a useful way why two string is actually used and not only you know it might be a little confusing to understand I mean this is just an example it doesn't really do anything but in the next tutorial I'll show you guys um, like one example where we would actually need it and use it but for now hopefully you get the main idea again the key points is um, the probably two things you're going to be confused upon is this I mean what's highlighted right now anytime you use that keyword this it's a reference to the current object so it's gonna say alright just reference the current the current object so it implies that it needs a string so since it needs a string it says alright I need a string here it says oh I see that's why he gave me this two string method so anytime I need a string I know where to look so makes sense and if it doesn't it will in the next tutorial but for now, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you understand the basics of a two-string method. And don't forget to name it two-string. That's very important. So again, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next tutorial. What's up, guys? Welcome to your 43rd Java tutorial. And in this tutorial, we're going to be building the rest of our program. And I'm going to be teaching you guys about something called composition. Now, what composition means is that it means that a class, and this is the one we're going to be building today, instead of just variables and methods it can also have references to other objects for other classes and it could uh... well i'll show you guys what it means so go ahead in our tune class again in the last tutorial we, we built this pot pie class in our tune class just clear everything out and we're going to have two um... members for now go ahead and type private string and this is a new one name and that's gonna be used just to store my name or something and we're gonna also have a reference to another class the pot pie class so go ahead and type private pot pie and type birthday since this program is just gonna output my name and the birthday but it's gonna do it in a cool way so now that we have two members of this class right here we have a new name variable and we have a reference to a pot pie object or uh, object so let's go ahead and well let's use it so the first thing we want to do is build our constructor so this class is named tuna so we have to name our method tuna and that's constructor what this constructor is going to take is two arguments it's going to first take that string variable that we have and we'll just name it the name so we don't forget and we also want a reference to our pot pie date object so let's go ahead and put pot pie and let's go ahead and write the date or you can write the birthday or something like that and now in the body of our constructor let's just go ahead and set name uh... set it equal to the name and let's go ahead and set birthday that we declared up here and set it equal to the date so now we are in sync we are good to go but what we want to do now is go ahead and make another two string method so let's go ahead and put public string to string and just like we did in the pot pie class in this um, method it's going to take no arguments and for the body we want to return a string of course so string format and for a format I don't really like when it fills it in for you you know I want to do the work myself and in our format just go put uh, my name is percent s and that's gonna fill in your name and then let's go ahead and put my birthday is percent s and here's work is kind of tricky name birthday so now if you guys can understand the next thing I'm about to say you'll understand um, the next 
thing I'm about to say. Huh, it sounds easy enough, but you'll understand the key concept of this tutorial. So now, whenever we call, whenever we need a string representation of this, what we're going to do is this. It's going to return my name is, and it's going to look right here to see what it wants to fill in for name. Well, the name was up here, and it's going to be whatever we gave it, passed it in. But for birthday, there isn't a really string named birthday. Birthday is just a reference to the date object. And again, what this means, since it's a reference to an object and not a string, anytime it needs a string from an object, it's going to say, all right, anytime you need a string, and I'm only an object, I'm not a string, maybe I can help you out. Well, I'll go to my class, and I'll go to the to string method, and then I can give you the information that you need. So when I put percent %s right here, you don't necessarily need to pass in a string object, or excuse me, a string variable. What you can do is pass in an object instead, and whenever it looks in that class, it implies through via the to string method that this is the string you're looking for. So again, you can do two things when you're using this. You can either pass in a regular string, which is just like a bunch of letters, or you can pass in an object, and whenever you do pass in an object, it looks in that class and it looks to the to string method of that class. So that's two different ways when you're using the print format that you can do that. So now that we got a to string method, which is pretty much the string representation of an object in the tuna class, and we got a string representation of an object in the pot pie class, I think we're ready to build some actual objects now, put them to use. So go over in your main uh, Bucky or I don't know, whatever you named it, and let's go ahead and build some more objects. One more to be exact. So now that we already built one from Pot Pie, we probably don't even need that anymore, but we'll keep it up for good looks. Uh, what we want to do is build one for Tuna. So Tuna, Tuna, ooh, got the hiccups. Tuna object, make sure I typed everything right, got the hiccup in between there. And new Tuna, and now we need to pass in two variables. Again, this is going to take two parameters, because look, our constructor takes two parameters. It takes a name and it takes an object. So for the name, let's go ahead and pass in Greg. And for the object, let's go ahead and pass in pot object that we just built right here. So in order to see what parameters it takes, look in your tuna constructor and you can see it takes a string and it takes an object. Well, our string is Greg, that's my real name, and our object is pot object and we just build it up here now everyone knows my real name oh great so now let's go ahead and just output what we did so system out print line and let's go ahead and just write tuna object but we have to spell it right and we better change that to Bucky for good looks and now uh, let's see I should be good to go so let me run this, see how many errors I got, and then I'll talk you through one last time what we did. It says, my name is Bucky, birthday 456. You got it? So in the first line, in line number three, we built a constructor. In the second line, we built a tuna object. Well, I guess we built objects in both lines, but here's what it did. You, already, you guys already know what this one did from last tutorial. And for the tuna object, when we built it, in the um, constructor we passed in two arguments my name in this object right here it took the name and set it equal to name and it took the object and set it equal to birthday and then it says alright just return it in a string format well my name is Bucky easy enough my birthday is this object and it says alright how am I going to turn an object into a string well, anytime I want to turn an object into a string, I just go to that class and go to the to string method. So again, I'm going to repeat it. Anytime you want to turn an object into a string, it looks to that class in the to string method. So that is your quick tutorial on what the to string method is. And also, um, again, like I said, this is called composition. 
and that's referring to objects um, let me show you guys that's referring to objects in other classes as members so this was composition right here so thank you guys for watching let's see how much time I got oh just in time so thank you guys for watching uh, make sure to check out my next tutorial get out of my white house and uh, make sure to subscribe to my channel because you know it's the best channel ever so I'll see you later what's up guys it's Bucky welcome to your 44th Java tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to be going over something called enumerations or enum uh, we learned about them before I think we might not have if we didn't you know no big deal we're both learning today but the first thing that we're going to do well let me tell you what uh, enumerations are they're pretty much kinda like classes but they you're gonna use them to declare constants at least in this tutorial we are so let's go ahead and anytime you want to do this instead of public class tuna you put public enum e -N -U -M. and now you can use this in a specific way so like I said the first thing we're gonna want to do is declare a bunch of constants of the enum type so let's go ahead and make some constants or these are pretty much going to be like variables that never change so I'm gonna make like three names Bucky and these are in essence objects so let me give these a few parameters and then you'll see why later on um, Bucky let's uh, give the first parameter a description word of the object and I'm gonna put nice since you know I'm doing this tutorial might as well say something good about myself and then let's just go ahead and put a string about like um, how old they are or something. I'll make it interesting for the other two ones. Now let's think of a next person. Let's think of uh, we'll do constants of my first girlfriends. So my first one was Kelsey, and she was she was a cutie. It was it was fifth grade. She's pretty cute. And uh, let's see, when I went out with her, I was ten years old and now put a comma because we're not done with our entire enumeration list and then the next girl I went out with was well it wasn't really a girlfriend but uh... we had a thing it was Julia she was uh... she was a big mistake and I was twelve years old when I went out with her so now we're done we got three constants let's go ahead and end this statement with a semicolon now what we're going to do since we just made objects and again each constant is an object and it's gonna have its own set of variables in this entire enumeration so let's go ahead and give it two variables that we're gonna use later um, private final since we don't want them to change string since that's what we just made since we're in quotation marks and we'll put DSC for description and we'll copy this entire thing copy paste and we have description right here and what's a good name for this year or something year so now we have three objects which are actually enumerations we're calling or constants and they each have a set of their own variables one for description one for year so now what can we do what do we usually want to do when we create these well the first thing that we're going to want to do is create an enumeration constructor so let's go ahead and do that by of course typing the name of your class and then you probably want to put your two variables in um, put string description and make sure since this is um we're gonna use this make sure this is different than this and you should know why and then just put string and let's put birthday or something it isn't their birthday but I don't want to get confused at all I can't put why are something because it would just confuse me you know I'm easily confused got something to say about it? didn't think so so now let's put DSC or whatever you declare it up here just put equal to description statement and then go ahead and put um, birthday year equal birthday and now what do we got anytime here's what's gonna happen with Bucky it's gonna say alright with the object Bucky give it two variables a description in a year for the description pass in nice in this 22 we're gonna see is birthday so set year equal to birthday so now we can work with DSE and year good enough 
but now that we have a constructor we just pretty much set these variables equal to where they need to be we have no way of getting the variables yet so let's go ahead and create two methods that we can get the variables so public string since it's going to return a string and put get description or get des if you're lazy which I am so hey it works out and then in this one we want to return the desc that's just going to return a string of the description easy enough and guess what we're going to do in this method public string get um, put get year seems like a good name and this one is just going to return year the only problem with this it's a little too easy so now this is all we need to do with enumerations again enumerations are constants that are also objects pretty much and so we needed two variables to represent the two arguments and then once we have those two variables we can build a constructor and then this constructor allows us pretty much to set these variables equal to each other and return the information we wanted so let's go ahead and well let's just go ahead and use that information right now so what we want to do pretty much in our main um, class right here with our main method is build an enhanced for loop so let's go do that right here for and the first parameter you need is of course the class name and the the variable that you want to use in your for loop like we used um like description right here this is just a variable that we just made up this is going to be the variable that we just made up right here and that's the first like it's pretty much what you want to call your objects when you loop through them the next argument is you need an array that you need to loop through and let me tell you a little bit about this because this might be kind of confusing anytime you make an enumeration like this Java automatically makes it takes this constant these constants and makes a built-in array and the array is called whatever your enumeration is called and since I name my tune it's called tuna and when you write values like that this is a built-in array of the um, constants right here so if we're saying all right um I need an array bam you got an array right there and again you can't change this keyword values this values is called a static method and again this is how you get a built-in array so this is gonna loop through each of the constants first is gonna loop through Bucky then Kelsey then Julia and it's gonna assign them to people well you'll see what it does so now we just need to make a print statement so let's go ahead and put system and why do we need to make a print statement so we can actually see what's going on system out printf and let's just go ahead and make our two arguments the format is going to be percent s and let's put a tab add some spacing uh, percent s uh, add a tab percent s and a new line so it's going to write our name our description our age and then it's going to go to the next person so now we need our arguments the first thing we want is people because that's what the object is pretty much so in the first one it is just going to loop through our name which is this Bucky in our next argument what we need is to take that people object and use the method get wait what do I name that method people dot get description and what that is going to do is it's going to return a um let me find my screen recorder see how much time I'm at I got minute 30 what's going to do is return a string of our description and this last one people dot get year and what this is going to do is first of all I need to get uh, it messed it up for me people dot get year and what this is going to do is return a string of the year so let's go ahead and make sure I have a semicolon at the end of that and uh, one second and make sure I have this and let's go ahead and run it so run this okay and look at my results I got the object the description and the year object description year object description year so what it did again see if I can get it 
was it looped through the entire array of people and for the first argument it gave us the object name the description name and the year whatever year I assigned to them so in the next tutorial we're gonna be going over this and more but thank you for watching don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next tutorial so people welcome to your 45th Java tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to show you guys how to get a range of constants now this is going to be about eight times as easier than the last tutorial so you know just suck it up pay attention and uh, I try to make it interesting for you so since we need a range of constants and we only have three right here it's not going to be very exciting first of all and what kind of range can we get with three so let's add a couple more of my ex-girlfriends to the list um, I had one girlfriend named Nicole and let's find a description word for her she was Italian and I dated her when I was I don't know probably like 13 so I'm gonna put 13 and don't want that semicolon and my next girlfriend after this I would have to say is Candy this is when I moved to my new school she was my first girlfriend and let's say she was um let's put this nice she was different and um sh let's see how old I, was. I was in eighth grade so what's that 14 maybe I'm wrong but you know we don't have time to think we just have time to do and let's see after candy I got one in ninth grade but you know what's the fun in that there's this girl named Erin I had a huge crush on but uh I never went out there but you know what? I'm gonna add her to my list because I wish I went out with her so I'm gonna put I wish because you know she's like the one that got away and I had to be like 16 by the time I had a crush on her for a long time <sighs> Aaron what could have been oh anyways so now we have a longer list of constants right here so what we can do now is go back in our main method right here and we'll just keep this one right here this is what we did in the last tutorial but let's see let's go ahead and make a new line under this for loop I mean we might as well keep this for loop it's not hurting anything and in case you're just joining us this for loop pretty much printed out a uh, list of all the constants so let's go ahead and just print out a line so we can separate this for loop from our other for loop so system out this post system right system out print line and let's just go ahead and print something like um new line new line whoa 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 what's going on up in here alright let's just put and now for the range the hit cap socks embarrassing of uh, constants so now we pretty much got this for loop right here and we just got a line saying and now for the range of constants so well we just want to be able to see it, see it easier so now let's get to the meat of the tutorial and this is an enhanced for loop to go through the range instead of the entire thing so the first thing that we're going to need to do is at the beginning of our class before our class we need to import something we need to import the enum set class so java util enum e n u m s e t and what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to use a built-in method called range to well you'll see what it does later I mean it's the best way to learn right just to see so let's go ahead and build our enhanced for loop now just like last time it's gonna take two parameters the first one is what you want to name your things I'm just gonna name my people what you want to name your objects now the second one is that method now we could just plug a regular array in here but we want to have a range of the array we want it to start at let's say Kelsey and we want it to end at candy so I mean we can start and end anywhere so whenever like I said before Java automatically gives you an array of constants in the order that you did them in but in order to get just a specific set out of there or range what you need to do is this e num set period range and the range is the method and it takes two parameters from is the first one so let's just go ahead and write tuna which is the class Kelsey and what's going to do is look at tuna class and find this first constant Kelsey and that's going to be your starting point and for two let's just put tuna dot candy 
and let's just go ahead and show so now we have Kelsey to candy and everything included that's what that does it gives you a whole new array so now once we have that we can pretty much just copy what we have up here copy thank you for that and we'll paste that out here and so now instead of an entire array which was tuna values we have a specific set in the array which goes from all the constants from Kelsey to candy so now let me run this and see what we got let me exp nah, I won't expand it what's the fun in that so now we have our first array right here that has all the information Bucky to Aaron that was the entire array and then we says our line and then we goes and now for the range of constants and we cut out Kelsey Julia Nicole and Candy so using our enum set class in the method in that called range we we're able to provide it with two arguments where we wanted to start and where we wanted to end and this entire thing right here it gave us a new array so instead of looping through the old array we we're able to loop through this new and improved array to get only a specific set of data so that is your quick tutorial on my former love life and also um, how to loop through a specific range of an array using this range method right here and again don't forget to import this class or else you're not going to be able to use it so thank you guys for watching now you know all about enumerations constants and how to loop through them and all and whatnot I know how exciting right so in the next tutorial I don't know what we're going to be talking about but I promise it's going to be awesome so you might want to subscribe just a little hint so thank you for watching and I will see you next tutorial what's up guys welcome to your 46th Java tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to be going over what static variables are and how they're used so usually whenever you have a class that has objects each of the variables um, each object has its own set of variables like first name and I can make um, an object called Bucky and it would have its own first name Bucky and I could have another object named Tommy and it would have its own first name of Tommy but sometimes you want all the objects to share a single variable for example if you're gonna make members of a club and you're gonna like have the club count how many members were in it for example if I was in the club it would be one if Tommy was in the club it would be if me and Tommy were in the club it would be two if me Tommy and Megan were in the club it will be three and we each don't need to see that we each don't need an updated variable or a separate variable for three since the members in the club is all the same so for example there's some variables that you just can share and you're saying alright why don't you just write a separate variable for each object and update it well that takes a lot of time and space so um, you'll see what static is by the end of this tutorial and it's one of the most useful things that I actually taught you so far so listen up in this tutorial we're going to be building a club of course and the club is going to be of hot girls that I would like to go out with and yes they will be famous and no I will never go out with them so let's go ahead and make a couple uh, regular variables first for each object it gets its own private string and let's go ahead and put like first for first name and then go ahead and put private string and last for last name and now we need to give them a variable that they can share so go ahead and put private and put static and that static keyword means that every um, object shares the same variable so when this one changes it changes the all objects and before if you change one object's first name that only that object's first name changed but when you change a static variable they change with all objects so if I change this to 4 then all objects would see 4 got it good so static int and we'll have members of our club and we'll initialize the zero so without building anything we have zero members in our club so next let's go ahead and make our constructor so public um, our class name is tuna and it's going to take two arguments string first name and string last name this is how we're going to insert members in our club and in our constructor just put first equals first name last equals last name 
and let's just go ahead and put something like members plus plus so each time we add a member it adds one to our members variable so after we add our first member members will equal one when we add our second member members will equal two so next let's just go ahead and system out print format and our format will be something like again you can be creative with this if you want um, constructor for make sure you spell it wrong percent s percent s so it will be constructor for Bucky Roberts um, and then we'll have members in the club and then put like colon percent d and then a new line so we're gonna have like constructor for Megan Fox members in the club one constructor for Natalie Portman members in the club two easy enough so now we need to put first of course last in members and I spelled that wrong M-E-M-B-E-R-S members members oh, that's a pretty catchy tune alright now let's go ahead and write some more methods that are going to come in handy first we need something to get their first name so public actually let me think about this for this tutorial I'm teaching you is constructors right so we probably don't even need these yet but we sure do in the next tutorial so let's go ahead and in this apples and in our main function right here let's go ahead and make some members so let's go ahead and make member one tuna because it's in new class member one and we'll set it equal to new tuna and of course it takes the arguments again you can see what arguments it takes by this constructor over here a first name and a last name so the first name can be Megan and the last name of girls I want to date club can be Fox so now what we should have outputted on the screen is well might as well just do it constructor for Megan Fox and members in the club one easy enough so let's go ahead and make another one now um, tuna member two will make another object equals new tuna and we'll have something like Natalie and then Portman you don't know who she is definitely google it and let's go ahead and make one more for fun tuna member three equals new tuna and let's see let's get a let's get Taylor she can join the club too and Swift she is babe with a pretty voice hottie with body cutie with booty anyways so we made three different objects each one well let me run this sh show you guys that it works show myself that it works so we made three different objects right here one for Megan Fox named member one one for Natalie Portman named member two and one for Taylor named member three each of them has their own set of variables let's look at uh, this one Natalie Portman member number two for every um, object they have their own set of variables right here Natalie has her own first name right here and she has her own last name of Portman right here but they all share this members variable and they can like Megan Fox this object she can't see what Natalie's names are but she can see the members in the club has changed it too and when Taylor Swift joins the club right here since it's static it means all of these objects share the same static variable so they can all see that the members of the club has changed to three so that's why static um, variables are useful since you know sometimes you just need and again if you didn't have this um, on a new train of thought right here you would have to have a function to update all of these each time but you know why update three separate things one two three and then when a member leaves you would have to update three separate things one two three when you can just have one variable call it static and update it one time so that's your quick tutorial on what static is and why it's useful it pretty much instead of having to update it many times you just call it static and all members or objects can see it so thank you guys for watching this tutorial if you don't understand you will in the next tutorial because we're going to be going over static some more but like I said, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time. What's up, guys? Welcome to your 47th Java tutorial. And in this tutorial, 
I'm going to be finishing up talking about static members and also I'm going to be showing you a nice little trick that you can use uh, when accessing static members. So go ahead and in your tune class or not the class with not your main method in it class without your main method in there we go and let's go ahead and under this constructor let's go ahead and build three other simple little methods um, we're just gonna have one to return the first name return the last name and return the member so public string and let's just name it like get first it's not gonna take any parameters and we're just gonna have it return first simple enough and now let's go ahead and make one for last name public string get last and guess where we're gonna have this one to return last oh you guessed that oh not bad and now let's have one more and we'll name it um let's see public static remember this method needs to be static static int get M E M B R S. I know I could figure out how to spell members. Get members. And then what are we going to have this one do? Let's just have return members. So now we have three variables up here a private first, a private last, and a private members, which is static. This method returns first name, this method returns the last name, and this method right here, it's going to return um, the variable members. So now that we have three objects made, go back in your main apples class or whatever you called it. Let's go ahead and let me show you how each member has its own set of data. So let's just go ahead and for um, housekeeping sake, put system out print line. And let's just go ahead and print an empty line right there, there because it'll just be easier. Now let's just go ahead and copy that because we're going to be using it. Oh, I didn't know we could do that, did we? And let's just go ahead and put what do we want to print on our first line? And it's really our first line because this one's just an empty line. Well, what I want to show you that is even though they all share that variable called members, they each have their own set of data. So let's go ahead and put member one, which is our object one, which is Megan Fox, and we'll put get uh, first and then let's do this with last copy get last and what was the last one called get members so get members so here's what's going on now um let me make sure it's going to print out yep so anytime you call this one it's going to have megan fox and this is unique to its own object but it's going to look at get members and see that it's static. So it's going to share this variable with all the other ones. So depending on how many members are in this, then that's what it's going to print. So let me go ahead and run this. Click OK. And we have, again, we have our other data, data up there if you're wondering where it went. But it says Megan, which is unique, Fox, which is unique, and 3, which is shared among all objects. So now let's go ahead and change that to two. Member two, member two, member two. Now let's go ahead and run this, and now you can clearly see. Natalie, which is unique, Portman, which is unique, and three, again, that three. And that three is because this private static int. Static means, all right, this variable is shared between all objects. So we don't need to, you know, why would you make a separate variable if it like let me think how to put this why would you make a separate variable that is going to be unique that we're going to have to update in every object if it's the same value no matter what object it is so I mean you don't need to so we're not gonna so that's where static comes in handy and now let me show you that trick I was talking about um, since the variable static variables don't change between objects Static information is, value, is available even when you don't have an object. So, for example, say forget about all these objects right here. And we actually can't just delete them, but we'll delete these right here. And we can just add it in this print line, really. Instead of calling a separate object, like an object and then your dot separator and then your method, like that, 
what you can do with stack is just put the name of the class and put your dot separator and then put your method get members like that now let me run this and you can see the three right here can you guys see that the three right there so before we were never able to do this we had to get an object and build an object anytime we want an access to any of these members or any of these methods right here but with a static it's a little bit different because it's not going to change from object to object since no matter how many objects you have the variable is the same so that's why Java lets you instead of having to have an object which you can do by the way what we just did you can also just put the class name and put the static method ahead of that so again anytime you have a static method that use static variables um, you don't have to have a separate object you can just put the class name and then you can just put the method and that's how like in um stuff like math like math functions and math constants um, that's how they do that so that's just a nice little tidbit of information so don't forget that um, static variables are shared among all objects and that you don't have to access static um, methods with a specific object you can just do it with a whole class since it's the same so uh, thank you guys for watching I think I confused you enough for today but uh, like I said thank you for watching don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next tutorial what's up YouTube welcome to your 48th Java tutorial and in this tutorial we're going to be going over um, instance variables with the final like when you have like public final or private final int um, that's where we're going to be going over so unlike static um, I'm going to be showing you guys what final means so let's go ahead and in your tuna class right here and this is the one that's not your main apples is, has my main method so go into another one I name my tuna you can name yours whatever you want as long as it's a fish that's key it has to be fish or this program won't work I'm just kidding but you know just a little joke and let's go ahead and the first thing we're going to want to do is make um, a variable that's going to be private as well but you got to spell it right that's the key private there we go I know I'd get it eventually int sum and what this is going to do is hold the sum of our numbers that we're about to add up now let's uh, like begin the tutorial what we want to do now is make a variable with the type final so private final and it's going to be an integer variable and I hit button there embarrassing and let's just name it number or something and um, go ahead and put it in caps because it's going to be a constant so we know that the constants are in caps k k there you go k k that's how you can remember it so now the key or what final is is whenever you write final in front of a variable or a constant it means that you can't modify this no matter what so we just declared it whenever we set it equal to something whatever we set it equal to we can only set it equal to it once so if we put number equals two then that number is going to be two for the rest of your life you can't change it no matter what but another thing is we declared it right there but we didn't initialize it which means we didn't set it equal to anything so we're gonna have to do that in our constructor so again you can either do it right here or you're in your constructor so let's go ahead and make a constructor put public tuna and just put int x uh, this is going to be a temporary variable and then put number equal to x so whatever we pass in for our argument that's what number is going to be equal to and again don't mess it up because um, you can't change this you can't later in your program write alright we're set it equal to 2 here but we're going to set it equal to 15 later on or 18 or 32 you can't you can only set it equal to something here and it stays like that forever now let's go ahead and build another method so let's go ahead and write um, public void make it called add because what's it going to do it's going to take that sum that we have up here and it's going to be zero default and let's just add the number to it so again the sum variable is going to change but this number is always going to be like 10 or whatever we say it is and now let's just build one more method so we can actually see what's going on public string to string 
So again, you learn what two string method did last time. Whenever you need your object in a string format, it returns it. So let's go ahead and return string format and oh, it already started filling out for us. Uh, the format just can be put something like sum is equal to percent d and then put like a new line for good looks and then for your arguments just put sum so this is going to change because it's the number that stays the same and not the sum and how do we know that because number variable is final and sum is just private sum can change so now that we got that look it over and make sure it's um, the exact same as mine we can go to our, our main class which is apples in this case so go ahead and let's create an object so tuna tuna object equals new tuna and let's go ahead and put um, something like 10 so now what this is going to do since we passed in 10 to our constructor it's going to take 10 for x put 10 for x right here and set number equal to 10 so now for this object number equals 10 no matter what we can't change that so anytime uh, we use number like add number to sum we add 10 to sum simple enough so now let's go ahead and well let's go ahead and make a for loop using this object so let's just put four and let's make a simple loop put like int i equals zero um, if i is less than five and i plus plus so it loops five times one two three four yep loops five times um, it really doesn't matter what you have inside your for loop this isn't important just had to make make something real quick now we can go sit ahead and say what do we want to do five times well let's go ahead and add um, let's call this uh, method five times so the first time it's going to be 10 when it adds it the second time it's going to add uh, another 10 to it so it's going to be 20 then it's going to be 30 40 50 simple enough so let's go ahead and add tuna object and how you use it is add right there so now we did our method um, five times but we can't really see anything because this method right here it doesn't return anything so we need to return it right here so let's go go ahead and put system out let's go ahead and let's do a print format and let's just go ahead for the format we'll put something like let's we'll keep a simple percent s and for the arguments let's just go ahead and put tuna object so let me go ahead and run through this and show you guys the results. Sum equals 10, sum equals 20, 30, 40, 50. So now let me talk to you guys one last time why this happened. Make sure, hopefully I'm in my screen recorder. And eh, good enough. So what we did is we made two variables. Well, let's just go ahead and do it this way. We made an object called new tuna or tuna object was the name of our object and we passed it the parameters 10 for the constructor so it took that 10 and set number equal to 10 alright simple enough what's next well we looped through this five times so what did we do five times we did this add method five times so first for add it took that number 10 and added it to sum so now sum was equal to 10 then it just spit out 10 and then the next time on round number two it took that 10 and added it to 10 then we got 20 so now it spit it out 20 then it took 10 and added it to 20 which was 30 then it added it to 30 which is 40 then it added it to 40 which is 50 uh, so now that that's all done so that is pretty much um, your really detailed tutorial on a really simple explanation that whenever you make a final variable you cannot change it so for example if we say down here um, tuna object dot number um, equals 15 look at this right here we get an X right here the field tuna number is not visible that means that it can't change pretty much so that's pretty much all in all, I could have skipped this whole tutorial and said, all right, when you write final instead of a variable, it means you can't change it. But I didn't. I decided to give you guys the whole spiel instead. So thank you guys for watching. And hey, if anyone wants to do fantasy football with me, um, leave a comment and let me know because I want to do fantasy football with someone. 
So thank you guys for watching and don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time. What's up guys? Welcome to your 49th Java tutorial. And in this tutorial I'm going to be talking about inheritance. Now what inheritance is, is pretty much inheriting stuff from another class. So why is this useful? Well say we have um, two classes right here, tuna and pot pie. And in the tuna class we have a method like um, public void we'll just name it eat and let's say um in this method all it does is go system out print line and then it just prints something like um i am the eat method and say we had a bunch of different little food classes and every single food class had this method so tuna had it and pot pie had it and say we had a bunch of other ones like chicken liver ham they all had the same exact eat method so then your boss comes in and tells you alright you know when you wrote the eat method and said I'm the eat method well we actually want you to say I am the eat methods with a s so now you gotta go in every single different class class and change that one method and add a an s on the end and you're saying alright I wish instead of having all these copies that I would have to maintain if I could just have one single copy so that's what exactly inheritance is instead of having all these copies in different classes that you have to maintain you can only have one single copy that you have to maintain and each of these classes can inherit that so let's go ahead and copy this and since tuna and pot pie are both foods I made this new food class right here and what this food class is going to do is it's going to store all the things that tuna and pot pie have in common and right now they have this eat method in common so we can go ahead and get rid of this method right here and get rid of this method in here and instead of having all these separate methods and all these classes we only have to maintain this one method in the food class so how exactly does this work and how can we only have one method to kind of take care of well this is what inheritance is instead of having a bunch of different methods what this tuna class and pot pie class can do is it inherits everything the variables and methods from this main food class and whenever we do this the kind of methods that inherit the stuff those are called the subclasses and the stuff that they or the class that they inherit from is called the superclass. So again, these two tuna and pot pie classes are gonna inherit all the stuff that's in the food class. And the food class is called the superclass, and the tuna and pot pie class are are called the subclasses. So how exactly do we inherit everything? well instead of say inherit from what java said is it gives it a new keyword name extends e x t e n d s and whenever you write extends this means inherit from so if you say public class pot pie extends food this means alright in this class pot pie we're gonna inherit everything from food so we're gonna inherit any variable that would be in here in all the methods so let's go ahead and do that same thing from tuna so public class tuna this class e x t e n d s it extends food so now anything that's in food is inside pot pie and tuna even though we can't see it that's what we mean so let's go ahead and let me show you guys that right now so say we go or wherever your main method is right here let's go ahead and make an object so i'm going to make my tuna tuna object and let's just go ahead and put new tuna let's just go ahead and make the same thing with pot pie so pot pie pot object I'll be JCT I know I figure it out eventually new pot pie so now we have a tuna object and a pot pie object I'm sure I didn't mess anything up so now even though we have no methods in here they inherited all the methods from food so we would use those methods just like we would anyone else so this method is called eat don't remember and it's in pot pie and tuna even though you can't see it so let's go ahead and put tuna 
object dot eat and pot pie or what's it called pot object dot eat and see what happens and we're getting a error right here oh we forgot an equal sign there we go and now when you run this we see I am the eat methods and this one came from tuna and this one came from pot object so that's how you can have you can inherit all the methods from another class using the extends keyword but what if you're saying alright you know I have a bunch of different foods and I know we only have two foods right now this is just to demonstrate but if you're saying alright I have a bunch of different foods like tuna pot pie chicken liver but I have this one class called tuna and I want to inherit all the stuff from food but I want to change this one method right here well what you can do is override certain methods and in order to override certain methods you just put the method into the class the subclass and you recreate it so then if you say alright I am the new method of tuna so make sure you uh, spell a couple things wrong there and now whenever you override something you inherit everything from the food class but the methods that you recreate they're gonna override or overpower the methods that you inherited so now if we go ahead and run this we see this let me get it up for you there we go I am the new method of tuna and this is the method that we overrode and again the, it's the easiest thing in the world whenever you want to override something all you have to do is pretty much just create it again and then you don't have to worry about you know well it's pretty much as simple as that I can't explain it any better but that's how you override something in pot objects we didn't override that method so that's why it got the default food method and the last thing or the last couple things I want to talk about real quick if say tuna extends pot pie and pot pie extends food then tuna inherits all the stuff from pot pie and food it's like a little hierarchy so let's go ahead and delete this and now when tuna extends pot pie it inherits all the stuff from pot pie and food and the last thing I want to take note of is that only let's go ahead and get rid of one of these objects let's go ahead and get rid of the pot object only the public methods can be inherited let me see how much time I got left two minutes only public methods can be inherited so if you have a private method in the superclass again the superclass is the one that the subclass inherits from and we want to change that to food so right now tuna is inheriting all the stuff from food but food has this method in here that's private what private means is alright you can't inherit this from me in order to inherit it it needs to be public like we did before but when we put private like this and try to run this right here we get a little error right here and it says the method eat is not visible so whenever we try to run it I'll show you the syntax error down here and then pretty much this is saying alright this isn't visible because food has a private thing that you try to inherit and use and you can't it's private it's not public so that's your real quick tutorial on inheritance and pretty much anytime you want to inherit crap from another class just write extends and extends is this a real fancy word for tuna inherits from food or tuna inherits all the methods and variables from food and again well that's it for this tutorial I already filled your brain with enough so that's your real quick tutorial on inheritance I hope I made it simple I hope you guys can understand so thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next tutorial what is going on people welcome to your 50th Java tutorial and I know it's been a while since I uh, started making Java tutorials but hey we're gonna get back on track and uh, start learning some more Java so actually I had planned out that we we're gonna learn polymorphism but I think I'm just gonna skip right to GUIs because it's a lot funner and um, it's better if we know how to make an interface before we start getting into some uh, other stuff plus when we have an interface and stuff you can see what everything does 
and you're not just typing random code that you're like, all right, what is this, the matrix? Because, you know, it's time we started building an application that the user can interact with and see. So if you don't know what a GUI is, or some people call it a GUI, it's a graphical user interface. And just like this right here, it has a title bar at the top, a menu, drop downs, uh, it has a whole different range of buttons. And that's what we're going to be making instead of this right here where it's like the Matrix style because, I mean, come on, it's 2009. If you're watching this story on 2009, that is. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, the first thing you need to know is that all GUIs are built from GUI or GUI components. That means there has to be a component for a menu, um, a dialog box, um, scroll bars. You have to add each one of those individually. So how do you just go ahead and get these components? Well actually Java has a built-in um, class that stores all the components you need. You just need to tell it where to put it and what to do with it and they are um, created using different methods and the methods you use to create this in the class is called the JOption pane class now like I said um, this class is built into Java so anytime you want to make a button all you need to do is call it from the class and there are different ways to do this but this is the easiest way so in order to get all those buttons and toolbars and everything we first need to import the entire class so let's go ahead and before you're even class right here just go ahead and put import java x dot swing dot j option pane and make sure you type the j in the o capital option pane and just like that and now we're getting a little error that says um, the import Java J option pane is never used so let's go ahead and fix that by using some stuff right now so now we imported the class which means we have access to all the crap in it so let's start using some of that crap the first thing we're going to want to do is set two variables by the way I'm going to build a program where you enter a number in one box and then click OK you enter a number in another click OK and the end box the third one um, shows your answer you're seeing a little bit so we need to set this equal to string variable and set it equal to first number and I'm just gonna write F and N or uh, excuse me F N for first number now what you need to do is call the class which is J option pane use your period or dot separator and the method for an input dialog is show input if you couldn't tell by these hundred pop-up things that pop up dialog and it's gonna take one parameter right here and this is the message now what this is is the message or the prompt which you want to tell the user to do so we just want to put in a string enter first number so now whatever they enter into that first number is going to be stored in the variable fn so now we need a second number so let's go ahead and copy this press enter paste it and let's just set string second number and we'll just put Second, enter second number right there. Make sure I got my uh, whatever it's called semicolon. And let's go ahead and move this over here because uh, just because I feel like it. Now, here's a little thing that you need to know every time they enter something in here, show input dialog method only is able to get a string. So we can't add strings, strings are pretty much letters and, and numbers that it doesn't see as a number. So we need to tell Java, all right, instead of viewing this as a string, we want you to view it, in it as an integer so you can do some math with it later on. So what we need to do is convert these variables to integers. So this has nothing to do with um, J option pane. This is just Java right here. So Java num, or excuse me, int num1 equals integer dot parse int. And what this does is convert whatever I type into here and stores it as an integer in num1. So I want to put fn, and what this does is take the string, which say it's 5, and converts it into the number 5. So now let's go ahead and do this for num2. Num2, we want to take the second number we typed in and convert it to a variable called number 2. So now the last thing we need to do is just show the sum 
So before we even do that, let's just add the sum. Int sum equals um, what do we put num one plus num two, no spaces. And now we got the final answer in the sum variable right here. Let's tighten that up a little bit. That's what she said. And now we can go ahead and display this. Now the box that you use to display is something called show message dialog. So let's put J option pane dot show message dialog. And this is a little different than show input dialog. Inputs for inputting, messages just for displaying. Now this method takes four parameters. The first one is um, it's a parameter where to position it and if you put null it positions it right in the middle of the screen. The second one is what you want to say like for your prompt but it isn't prompt it's just a message. So let's put the answer is and let's just put add sum. So it's going to be like the answer is five or something like that. Now the third um, parameter is what's, what you want to appear on your title bar. So let's put a, like the title or something something easy like that. And the fourth parameter you need is the message that's going to pop up. Now I'll go over this later if I got time. But for right now just put J option uh, was it pain then put plain underscore message like that. And you don't need to put this last thing in quotation marks. So um, again, well, that's pretty much it. Let's just go ahead and run this program. I'm tired of waiting around. So let's go ahead, click OK, run it. Enter your first number, 3. OK. Enter your second number, 5. OK. The answer is 8. And now I can talk you through this one more time. So now, once we go ahead and run this, what we're getting is this very first thing the show input dialog and it says enter your first number and we're going to go ahead and enter 4 press ok now once we press ok it stores that 4 in fn variable right there and also it allows us to move on to this other show input dialog it doesn't move on until you complete the show input dialog so enter your second number 6 ok so now what it did right here so it took that 4 and converted it to a number and took that 6 and converted it to a number so that you can add the two sums right here. And lastly, it took that show message dialog, which if I can get it back right here, and it says that null, which means position in the center of our screen, the answer is sum right here. And again, that third parameter was the title, which appeared on the title bar. And that last one, you have the option of putting icons on your um, GUI or user interface that we built but we're not going to put icons on here now mostly because they're stupid um, if you want to have a, something like an error you can put an X on there, a warning, you put like a I don't know, they're stupid but we'll probably put them in next time because I'm stupid too so um, but that's a real quick tutorial on how to use J option pane to uh, make a simple graphical user interface aka GUI so in the next tutorial we're going to be building our GUIs and add them some more function add some more cool buttons and stuff like that so thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next tutorial what is going on people welcome to your 52nd Java tutorial and this tutorial is probably going to be pretty long it's probably going to be a multi uh, part tutorial and we're going to be talking about event handlers so what an event handler or event handling is is in the last tutorial I showed you guys how to build a simple uh, GUI or GUI well what an event is is anything that the user can do like move their mouse click a button press enter those are called events in computer language now what an event handler is is the code that responds to your mouse movement or button clicking so the event would be click a button the event handler would be the code that says okay when you click this I want another box to pop up that says you just click the button or something like that so the event is what the user does the event handler is what the programmer makes when they do that event and this overall process is called event handling so um, I'll be talking about this later on but you guys need to know um, pretty much I just want to tell you in this program or tutorial 
we're going to be building um, a window on the screen and we're going to be building some text boxes inside that window and whenever the user enters text and press enter um, the event handler is going to say alright I'm going to pop up another box so let's just go ahead and get started if you don't know what I'm talking about then you'll figure it out eventually okay I need a little break now the first thing we need to do is import a bunch of crap that we're going to use in this tutorial. So I'm going to go ahead and type import java dot awt dot flow layout and make sure your A is not capitalized and go ahead and you can just copy this right here because we're going to be using something similar to it. So we imported java awt flow layout. The next thing we want to import is java dot awt dot event dot action listener let me make sure I spell listener right yep and what this does is flow layout pretty much gives you layout the listener listens or pretty much waits for the user to do something like press enter or something so now the last thing we need to pour, import from the awt is event Come on, cursor. Seriously. AWT dot event dot action event. And these are events which I told you about last time. Now we need to import four things from the swing. So let's go ahead and import Java X. Make sure you have the X swing dot J frame. And now we can go ahead and, well, we might as well copy that because we're going to import three other things. Copy, paste, paste, paste. We need to import JFrame, JText field, and make sure that you got your capitalization, same as mine, with a T and the F capitalized. JFrame, JText field, JPassword field. And text field is somewhere where you can type text. Pass password is the same thing, but instead of showing the text, it covers it up in asterisk so you can't see and the last thing is option pane so now we imported everything that we need for this tutorial and these pretty much are all the built-in methods and variables that we're going to use so now what we need to do for our tuna class is just like before we need to extend um, or inherit all the stuff from J frame and what this pretty much does is give us all it pretty much lets us use a window so now we created a window like any other program now we can start putting stuff in it so we're gonna put three items plus a password field in it or pretty much four text fields so let's go ahead and make variables for those um, let's make our item our first text field first so um, private J text field and you need to put J text field and you can name anything you want I'm just gonna name my item one and I'm gonna make three of these so I'm just gonna copy this because I am extremely lazy um, item two and item three in the last sorry about that I had to take a little break help my roommate find his phone but alright so we created three text fields right here now let's go ahead and create our last password field and we'll set that to private as well because I mean why not J password field like that and let's just uh, give this a variable oops password field looks good so now I did something oh no semicolon embarrassing so we created three items plus a password field now let's go ahead and create our window so let's go ahead and create a constructor for this and since my class is named tuna I'm gonna have to create a method that's named tuna so I'm just going ahead and gonna type public tuna doesn't take any arguments and whatever I create in this is pretty much the window so the first thing I need to do or first thing I actually want to do is add a title to this and if you remember from the last tutorial to do this you just put super and then in your um, argument you put the title or whatever you want for the title not gonna get anything fancy because I'm not creative at all so now we're gonna have to set the layout for this which is pretty much how things are placed and we don't want to have to code a new layout and place everything so we're just going to grab a one by default and how you do this put set layout and if you're wondering where all these methods are coming from they're imported somewhere up here all these built-in methods that I'm using you just can't make set layout and put it in everything you actually have to import it 
So set layout takes one argument, and the argument for this is new flow layout, just like that. And that is a uh, method in itself, so make sure you have that type just like that. So now we have a title and a layout to our window. So let's go ahead and start adding those um, text fields right there. So the first thing we're going to add is the item 1. And we're going to set this equal to new J text field. And in the uh, parameters for this, set the length of it as 10. And now we have an item, but we didn't add it to the window yet. So let's go ahead and add item 1 and this will add the item to our window so now although you can't see it, you pretty much have a blank window with just a little text field on the screen now we're going to go ahead and do that for the rest of our items so let's go ahead and put item 2 and set this one equal to and these are going to be a little bit different just change things up a little bit um, new j text field but is your parameters go ahead for this one and put like enter text here now what this is going to do is give you default text inside and it pretty much is like a prompt now let's go ahead and add this one to the screen item 2 so now we have a pretty much an empty window with two things on our screen two text fields so now let's go ahead and change our item 3 variable to yeah you guessed it new j text field and for this one we'll go ahead and type all right, let me think of something to do. There we go. Let's go ahead and type, we'll make this text uneditable, and we'll give it a default value of 20. And now we have um, a text field that says uneditable in it, and we want to make sure that the user cannot edit this. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is take that item 3, which is that text field, and how you set the editableness is go set editable, and what you're going to do for this is put false and if you put false in that that text field is not going to be editable so the user is going to be able to change what's on the screen I mean uh, read what's on the screen but they aren't going to be able to edit it and now what we want to do is just I'd add item number three to that and the last thing we're going to make is our password field so let's go ahead and write password field and we're going to set this equal to new j get it password field make sure I typed everything right and as a default you can give um get out of there um, my pass or something and this is going to show up in asterisk on your screen so now that we have that we can just go ahead and add um the password field or oh, don't want that so now we have a screen with four things on it we have four different text boxes and each one of them is a little different I just want to show you guys that um, changing the parameters does a little thing different to it and uh, you'll see this later on visually but in the next tutorial we're actually going to be adding an event and handlers to this that means when you enter text and press enter do this or do that but for now I just wanted to get our window set up and in the next tutorial we're going to start programming this baby so I cannot wait uh, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time what is going on guys welcome to your 53rd Java tutorial and this is pretty much a continuation of the 52nd one and there's probably going to be a 54th one but um, just a real quick view what we did is pretty much already uh, if you didn't watch 52 for some reason we just built a window and put four things in it <laughs> and that's uh that's pretty much it and now what we're gonna do is pretty much add some functionality to this and what we're gonna say is alright when you enter text in one of those text fields and press enter what we want to do is pop up another box saying what you entered like when a user would type in something and it says like a verification or something so let's get right to it now what we need to do is the first thing that we're going to, need to do is build an action listener object so what what this means is we have four text fields waiting on the screen and they're pretty much dumb and they don't do anything right now what we want them to do is to add some brains to them and have them waiting on the screen in listening it's called and when you listen you're pretty much just waiting for an event to happen so right now they just look pretty they're not even waiting for anything so what we want to say is alright text boxes listen for something to happen and when that happens we want you to execute a bunch of code 
So the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to build another class to execute the code. But this class, I'm going to build an object for this class before I even build the class. So the class name is going to be the handler, and we're going to get some errors right here, but that's fine. And I'm just going to name my object handler, and this is going to be equals new handler class. And if you're saying, all right, where is this handler class? We didn't build it yet, but I will, we promise. So actually, hold on. New the handler. There we go. And what this does is it pretty much builds an action listener object. So now we're going to make a new class later on um, that you'll see what this does later. But what we need to do is add this object to each of the items. So item 1, what we need to do is add action listener. And what this takes as an argument is the object we just created. So that's why we need to do that. And the object, you can see it is called handler. So handler, right like that. And we need to do this for each object. So let's go ahead and copy this. Copy and paste, paste. I'm two, I'm three, and of course our password, which is password field right there. And add add action listener and this is of course going to take the handler argument again so now we have an object of the class the handler which we didn't make yet but that's what we're going to do right now so once you uh let me make sure here's jframe here's the one class here's where one class ends or pretty much our constructor and now here's another thing i'm going to tell you um this pretty much whole thing is our constructor which is pretty much a method for um, this tuna class and you're probably thinking alright I'm gonna build a new class I'm gonna build it on the outside of this well actually we're gonna build another class but we're gonna build it inside this tuna class and when you do that when you build a class inside a class the class that's inside inherits all the crap from the class that's outside so that's what we want to do so let's go ahead and make this private because it's no need to make it public. Class, and I hit insert, class the handler, or whatever you named it right there. And now we see we get a whole bunch of other error messages. Implements, P, implements action listener. And I spelled, let, there we go implements action listener now what we want to do is go ahead and build a body for this and now what we have is our class and why did we need to name it the handler because that's what um, the object was and it implements action listener and what this means is pretty much that this is going to be the class to handle the events and you'll see why later on but I know it's confusing right now but what this action listener class is is it takes one method there's only one method we're going to be building in this class and that's the method that's going to be called automatically whenever an event occurs and to do that type public void and I know this doesn't make any sense to you right now it's weird because you kinda of have to build the whole program to see what's going on but I promise by the end of this you'll see what's going on action and you need to name this performed and as a argument you need to take action event and then you need to name uh, your variable something like event like that and now as well let's go ahead and start building the body for this so what happens in this private class right here is as soon as an event occurs whatever happens inside here is gonna handle the event so let's go ahead and type some stuff to um, pretty much just add a body to our method. The first thing we're going to do is build a string variable and we're just name it string and set it equal to an empty string. And this is going to be the sh final string that outputs, but um, you know we don't need to worry about that now. Now the next thing we're going to want to do is make pretty much a huge if statement and you'll see why in a second. The first condition we're going to test if the event and remember this is like an enter or a click and in this case is going to be if the event is going to be when the hu 
oh I can't talk when the user presses enter so if the event equals get source and the source pretty much means where it happens um, if it's equal to item one and what this means is pretty much if they clicked enter on text field number one then what do we want to do well the first thing we're going to want to do is take that string variable that is empty right now and we want to set it equal to string format and we would just use uh, C style um, formatting and we're going to want to set this equal to um, put something like field one uh, percent s and put those in quotation marks so what this is going to output is field one with a variable right here and as our variable what we want to do is print event and this is get action command now this is the last thing in this tutorial that's going to confuse you what get action command means after I add my semicolon is get the text from that location so if they type in Bucky in field one and press enter what this is going to do is say alright your event source or you hit enter at item number one so what I'm going to do is put field one equals Bucky and you'll see why later on but for now just follow with me the next thing we're going to do is build three else ifs so else if and just go ahead and copy this copy this paste in event 2 field 2 and we'll get the action command for that now let's go ahead and just copy this one more time copy and make sure my cursor's in the right spot oh cool it's messing up cool and paste uh, if event get sorts equals from item 3 then we just want to output field 3 equals that and now what we want to do lastly is put else if and let's go ahead and put event get source alright if this event occurs on what do we name it password field then what do you want to do set the string why are you messing up pause set the string equal to string format and and let's just go ahead and do the same thing the format is um, let's put password field is um, percent s and the arguments it takes is of course event get action command right there so now let me make sure we're good to go don't have any errors aside from these and what error are we getting right here the method add action there is undefined which is uh, we'll worry about that later and the last thing we're going to want to do uh, and actually I'm running out of time so I'll do it in the next tutorial in the next tutorial we will finish everything up so thank you guys for watching and I'll see you then what is up people welcome to your 54th and hopefully the last tutorial in this little three part series and before I get started I just want to tell you guys about one error that I did I spelled listener wrong like I always do and just change that to T-E-N-E-R and uh, if you have more than third grade education you should know that but I don't so now we can go ahead and continue with the rest of our tutorial so pretty much in this handling class or the class that handles um, the event what we did is we took a string variable and we set it equal to an empty string or a string with nothing in it and then we say alright if they type something into box number one and press enter then we're gonna say alright we're gonna change that string to field one equals whatever you typed in if they did it in field two field three or the password field uh, that's what we're gonna do so now we all we pretty much did is we changed that string variable so if they type Bucky for the string variable um, this pretty much changes the string variable and now the last thing we need to do in this class is pretty much output it on the screen somehow so this is the last line so don't worry just type J option pane 
and why do we get to use this because we imported it up here at J option pane and what this pretty much does is pretty much just a blank window and what we're going to do is show message dialog make sure I didn't spell that wrong too and it's going to take two parameters the first parameter it takes is null don't worry about that it has to do with positioning and the second one it takes is your variable you want to output in that string so now let me walk you guys through this one last time we imported a bunch of stuff to use that's not important the second thing we did is we pretty much built a window um, using JFrame, which we did in the last tutorial, you should know what, how we did that. Now, here gets here we get to the good stuff. What you definitely need in order to handle events is a uh, pretty much an event handling class that implements action listener, and we built that class right here. Now, once we made that class, we can create objects for that class, and we created a class, or excuse me, an object named handler so anytime that you use this object it's going to refer to this class right here and after we built this class and we built this object we're going to go ahead and add that object to each one of these items now we gave each of these items some functionality so before they were just sitting there and now once you press enter on them they actually do something and what does has to do with this method right here now inside your class that handles events you need this method and you need to call it action performed this is a built-in method that has to do with the action listener class this method gets executed automatically whenever an event occurs so the event that's occurred is enter so whenever they press enter what's going to happen is it's going to create an empty string it's going to test what you're going to want to change that string to and then it's going to output it right there so this is all the hard stuff we did right here so copy that and do exactly as I did now that we made all the hard stuff we can go ahead and just execute it like we always do so my main thing is called um, apples you can do anything you want the first thing we're going to need to import in the only thing so don't worry import javax javax dot swing dot jframe and this just make sure that we can use windows in our main method right here so now let's go ahead and start calling our um uh, object so let's go ahead and create a new object called bucky or whatever in my class was named tuna you can name it uh, or whatever year you can name your object um whatever you want but make sure well you should know how to do this right now equals a new object from the class tuna and the second line we want to put is the close operation like we did before so we're going to take that object which is pretty much the thing we just created that window and set default there we go close operation I didn't I was too lazy to type it all and the argument that this is going to take it's all this crap in my way is jframe dot exit underscore on underscore close and like before this just means that whenever we hit X we want to exit the program why why they don't do it automatically I don't know but you need to do it yourself the next thing we're going to want to do is set the size of the window and we do this by setting the size and we're just going to set this to something like 350 mm, by 100 I think what the heck was that? I just had like a piece of skin in my mouth or something. Pretty disgusting. By the way, I got something really disgusting to tell you um, next tutorial, or if I have time at the end of this tutorial. But it's a disgusting story that I heard the other day, so I'll tell you then. Next, last thing we need to do is set the visibility. So set visible. I need to learn how to spell. So, and we'll just set this to true. And now let me walk you guys through this one last time so now make sure we don't have any errors anywhere and go ahead and click OK 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 and hopefully this works and now here is what we built go ahead and type Bucky press enter it says field 1 equals Bucky and our text here go ahead and type um, Fred Freedy field 2 equals Freedy uneditable look this 
I'm typing. I'm typing. I can't edit it. So go ahead and press enter in that. Uneditable. And this password, um, by default, if you press enter, it's my pass. But you can go ahead and change that to something like that. And then it changes to GFGDS. So I'm going to talk you guys through this one last time how this works. Um, if you don't want to listen to me, you can go ahead and watch my next tutorial. Or watch some uh, videos of like dogs doing silly things online. But um, for those of you guys who really want to figure out how this works, I'm going to tell you right now. This all... Well, let's go ahead and just skip the good stuff right here. In order to handle events in Java, you need an event handling class. And that class needs to implement action listener. And what action listener allows you to do is put that listener on something, which means, all right, I'm going to wait for an event to happen. And once it happens, I'm going to do some code. And that, once we have this class, we can go ahead and create an object and why do we need to create an object well we need to create an object because this add action or add action listener method it takes an object as its argument so that's why we needed to create an object and the object it takes as the argument is how it wants to handle that event so why can't it just automatically know what event to handle because of this class right here well sometimes you have different events in different classes so that's why so now once we have this class that handles the event and the object built we can go ahead and add some functionality to this so what this method does is get performed automatically whenever you call this class it's kind of like a constructor but kind of not so and what this does is take the event as the argument which is in this case the um, pressing of the enter button what this does is says all right if event get source which means where the thing occurred equals item one if it occurred in text box item number one then what we're going to do is set the string equal to whatever was inside that text box if it occurred in item two set the string that was it what was equal to in that text box if it occurred in number three set the string equal to what was in that text box four same thing and now once we set our string variable to something depending on what was inside that text box we're just going to output it in the j option pane which was that little checkbox i mean that little box at the end that pretty much just said um greg or bucky or whatever i typed in there so that is your tutorial on how to handle events i'm sorry it was really long but it was also really necessary so i guys i hope you understand pretty much the basics of what i did um, we'll be going over this um, a little later, so if you don't, um, you'll probably figure it out. But thank you guys for watching, thank you for uh, supporting my channel, and for all the awesome comments and some of the not so awesome ones. But again, I thank all of you guys, all of the people who watch my videos. So um, I can't wait to do the next tutorial, so I'll see you then. What is going on guys? Welcome to your 55th Java tutorial and in this tutorial we're going to be getting into polymorphism a little bit and also talking about or building something called a polymorphic array to uh, demonstrate why polymorphism is actually useful. And it's a pretty confusing topic and trust me there are going to be a lot of tutorials on this. So if you're not quite sure um, what's going on by the end of this tutorial then I promise you in a couple of tutorials you'll be a pro on polymorphism. So in order to uh, demonstrate polymorphism, we first need to build a computer program that uses inheritance in one way or another. So what I did is I set up, and you can probably tell this if you watched my last tutorials, I'm going to have a super class called food. In this tuna class and pot pie class, since they're both types of food, they're going to inherit all the methods and variables in this food class. So the food is a super class and the tuna and pot pie are subclasses. I already um, put extends food and what extends food does is use an inheritance to inherit everything from food but you should know that already if you uh, watch my other tutorials just for the people who just started um, that's what I'm doing so now let's go ahead and build a basic method called eat in food so void eat won't take any parameters and what it will do is pretty much go system print a line pretty much system out print line and it's gonna say did I get that right? System out print line. Um this food is great. And now 
what tuna and pot buy does anytime you call the eat method it would say this food is great now that's nice and all but another thing about polymorphism and I'm just gonna do this for demonstration purposes we can overrate the eat method that if we put it in the tuna class and called it it'll say this tuna is great now and let's just do that one more time with pot pie this pot pie is great so even though it's inheriting the eat method from the food class we overwritten it or overwrote it with putting a new eat method inside the tuna and pot pie class so now when you call the eat method in tuna it says this tuna is great and now when you call the eat method in pot pie it says this pot pie is great so now let's get into polymorphism now that we have a program that uses inheritance what polymorphism is is pretty well first let me describe to you how we built um, reference variables and objects before we did something like tuna bucky equals new tuna and we didn't really think about what we were doing we just did it because that's how we were taught but if you're wondering alright why do I need to put tuna right here and tuna right here as well shouldn't I only have to put it once to know that I'm talking about that class well the thing is well first let me go over what these are this right here bucky is the reference variable that means whenever you refer to the variable bucky you're referring you are referring to controlling the stuff in this class or object which is tuna and this pretty much is the data type so it can control the tuna data type and this object is of type tuna but another cool thing is you can do this and this pretty much is the intro to pot sorry this pretty much is the intro to polymorphism not only is tuna of the tuna type but tuna is also of the food type so what you can do is some pretty cool things anything that inherits from the superclass which is tuna or excuse me the superclass is food can be assigned to bucky for example tuna since it inherits from food can be assigned to bucky pot pie since it inherits from food can be assigned to bucky and you're saying all right that's nice and all i can assign this that and the other thing but why actually would this be useful in any kind of way well the answer to that i will do one thing which you guys probably need and that's an example the quickest example and the most clear thing I can do is build something called a polymorphic array. And this stores objects of different classes in pretty much the superclass type. So let's go ahead and say we have food and that's the type. And let's go ahead and make an array object named Bucky. And we'll set this equal to new food2. So now we have an array and it's called Bucky and it's of the food type and remember like I said since we have something of the food type it can hold um, objects of tuna and pot pie so for example um, Bucky zero can hold objects of new pot pie just like that and we'll set Bucky one which is a reference variable and we'll set this equal to the object of new tuna and you're saying alright well that's still great you have one variable that can hold an object and another vari variable that can hold an object yeah these variables might be of the food class but I don't see why this is useful still well just wait a minute and trust me you'll see why in a little bit one um, reason for using polymorphism is to use polymorphic arrays and that would be something like this you loop through this array and in essence what it does is it calls each method of this class right here so let's go ahead and type for um, int x equals zero and just put something like x is less than two you can also put array length um, but you know you don't wanna and do plus plus x and now what we can do is say something like this um, bucky x e dot eat and what this is going to do is loop through each one of these objects and call the eat method. So it's going to loop through the first um, object, which was assigned Bucky zero pot pie, and it's going to call pot pie dot eat, which is say this pot pie is great. The next thing it's going to do 
is loop through the tuna object which is tuna.eat and then it says this tuna is good so then you save yourself the trouble of making um, a new object called tuna tuna object um, then you go tuna.e and then you have to make an object and you have to call each method and I just got rid of my curly brace right there so what this pretty much does is loop through each of your objects and calls the eat method for each one don't believe me I'll run it right here it says this pot pie is great this tuna is great bam how easy is that so that is pretty much your basics the polymorphic polymorphic array you can assign different objects to variables as long as this reference variable is of the superclass type and that way instead of having to build a new object for each one of your uh, you know having to build a new object every time you want to use a method from that thing you can build one um, reference variable of the superclass and assign it to objects of the subclasses and just loop through them with a polymorphic array so how cool is that and I know it's really confusing at first but once I show you some other examples aside from polymorphic arrays you're gonna understand um, exactly how to use this how it works and you'll be a pro at it so for now thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe and if you have any questions just leave me a comment and I'll try to answer them so thank you guys for watching again and I will see you next time what is going on guys welcome to your 56th job tutorial and in this tutorial I'm going to be talking about more about polymorphism and how you can uh, have polymorphic arguments and also return types and a bunch of boring stuff like that but I'll try to make it a little exciting and maybe I'll tell a funny story maybe I won't I guess you guys are gonna have to wait and see um, if you've been following my tutorials the first thing you probably noticed is I made a new class called fatty and we're gonna we need to build this class to demonstrate what fatty can do to food tuna and pot pie if you haven't guessed he's gonna be eating these classes because fatties love food tuna and pot pie trust me I know firsthand I'm fat I love them so we made this fatty class now let's go ahead and make a simple method in here it's gonna do public void digest which pretty much means eat and but we can't have eat tuna because eat is already method in here so we're gonna have digest and as a parameter it's gonna take a food object so let's go ahead and type food x and now we can go ahead and do something with that object let's tighten that up a bit that's what she said so now we're gonna pass in a food object and when we pass in a food object we're gonna take that object which is now named x and we're gonna call the eat method to that and bam that's our all we're gonna do so here's what we can do right now for example if we had a food object named Bucky we can pass in the name Bucky and then it's gonna say alright whenever we call Bucky dot eat it's gonna say this food is great so whenever we pass in a food object it's gonna call that food method which is eat right here but what you didn't know or maybe you did if you know Java what you didn't know is anytime you can pass in a food object you can also pass in objects of a subclass for example you can pass in tuna and pot pie so since this object or excuse me this method has the privilege of accepting a food object as its argument it can also accept any subclasses such as tuna and pot pie so oh would you say you don't believe me well let me just go ahead and prove it right here let's go in our main apples method and let's go ahead and start making some objects let's go ahead and make a fatty object and we'll name it Bucky because that's me and I am fat we'll say uh, equals new fatty with no parameters so what we did here is we created a fatty object named Bucky and let's go ahead and now once we can use this fatty class let's go ahead and give us a way to use the food objects so let's go ahead and create food we'll create fo for food objects equals new food and why do we need to create a food object because first of all I'll put your semicolons get out of my way box that's what he said and <laughs> uh, I crack myself up sometimes and why did we need to create this object for food well because this um, method takes an argument and that's a food object so that's why 
So now, now let's go ahead and call this. With our fatty object, which is Bucky, because I'm fatty, we'll put Bucky.eat right there. And now, let's go ahead and as our argument, remember, or excuse me, that's digest, isn't it? And as our argument for the digest method in our um, Bucky object, it takes one food object. So we only have this object right here, FO. So let's go ahead and pass that in and see how it works. Okay, run that baby. And it says, this food is great. Wow, that food must be great. wonder what it is. Probably double cheeseburgers, you fat piece of... S oh, sorry. And anyways, now you pretty much know how you can pass in objects in the methods. But wait, Bucky, you said that you can pass um, subclasses in as well. Well, I didn't lie. Anytime you can pass a food object in as a method, as an argument, you can also pass the subclasses, which are in this case tuna and pot pie. So, for example, we have this fatty digest method that takes a food object as his argument, but food also has the subclasses of pot pie and tuna. So let's go ahead and make a food. Uh, let's name it PO equals new food. Get out of here and bam, just like that. So not only can we pass in this super class of food object, we can also copy this because we're lazy, and we can also pass in this object PO which would be the pot pie. So let's go ahead and run this and it will be new pot pie like that and let's run it and see what we got. This food is great, this pot pie is great. So what point am I exactly trying to make? Well what we did right here is this. We created an object named Bucky so we can use all the stuff in this fatty class right here. And the only thing is, is this digest method. So, you know, we don't have a whole lot to work with here. We also created a new food object because this digest method, it took a food object as its argument. Now, after that, we created a pot pie object. Now, this pot pie object is a subclass of this food superclass. So, anytime this digest method can take a food argument it can also take a tuna or a pot pie argument as well so then I proved that to you guys because I know I'm a liar and I had to prove it to you guys I called that Bucky object with digest is the food object is my argument and I also called the pot pie object is my argument so that is pretty much a way that you can have polymorphic arguments and you can also have polymorphic uh, return types in the same way so we just went over arguments right here but you guys can figure out just return um, any other one if you want so that's that for this tutorial hopefully you guys learn if you didn't then you know I don't know what else to do watch the rest of my tutorials I guess oh disgusting story I told you guys that I'll tell you one of my friends she went to a uh, well I don't want to say the name of the restaurant but she went to a fast food restaurant before and she got this chicken sandwich and she bit into it and it was like creamy in the inside and she's like oh cool like a new cheese on the inside must be like like a cheese filling or something like that it tastes like blue cheese or something well anyways she ended up getting a uh, food poisoning and they found out that in the center of the chicken it wasn't a filling it was actually pus in the center of the chicken so when she bit into it pus burst out and she thought it was filling and she just ate it anyways and yeah she got food poisoning so if you think that's disgusting leave me a comment and, <laughs> and if you never want to eat a chicken sandwich again then I don't blame you but it wasn't from McDonald's or Wendy's so you guys are still good to eat there so in any way uh, thank you guys for watching hopefully you enjoyed my disgusting story and my tutorial so uh, I look forward to teaching you some more so I will see you next time oh by the way don't forget to subscribe what is going on people welcome to your 57th Java tutorial and this tutorial is going to be not a lot of coding actually it's going to be pretty much clearing up um, a whole bunch of concepts dealing with polymorphism and trust me you're going to have a huge um, a better understanding of polymorphism by the end of this tutorial so I just want to go over um, 
overriding a method real quick in something I didn't tell you about. We built this super class called food and two subclasses called tuna and pot pie. We called a method in food and we called it eat. And we overrode that method in tuna and pot pie. Each of these had an eat method that overrode it. So one thing I didn't tell you about overriding a method, anytime you override a method, you must take the same arguments as in the superclass method. So since this E argument didn't have any arguments in it, it didn't have like an integer, this tuna can't have like an integer argument for this. And this pot pie can't do the same. Whenever you put an argument in here, this is called overloading and that's totally different. But again, if the food if the main eat method doesn't take any arguments, which it doesn't, tuna and pot pie can't take any either. And also, uh, in that same path, it has to return the same thing too. So, for example, if you returned an integer in here, it would have to, excuse me, if you returned an integer in the superclass, it would have to return an integer in the subclass as well. And if you're saying, all right, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to not take any arguments and return the same stuff if I'm overriding it and in essence doing a whole nother method? Well, it's so that you can have consistency and that is just so anytime you can call the eat method in any of your other scripts, then it pretty much guarantees that you can use any of the subclasses as well. So if all of these methods take the same arguments and return the same things, then they are pretty much interchangeable and that allows you to use a subclass in substitution anywhere you can use a superclass. So that pretty much um, then you know what to expect. And another thing I want to talk about anytime you override a method so for example we have this food method in our superclass and we overrode it with tuna we cannot change the scope of this. So for example this food is public right here we can't put private void e. See, we're getting an error already. This changes the visibility of it and why would you override it with a private anyway? So, you know, you just don't want to do that. And as I talked about, overloaded method is not the same as override. What overloaded method is, if you hear anybody talking about this, an overloaded method is a method with the same name but it has different arguments. So, for example, we can do this in i and not get an error but this is a whole nother complete method so an over so if someone calls eat with a single argument then this method is called but for now I just want to tell you guys that overloaded and overridden are two totally different things so don't get them confused so now that we got that out of the way in in essence I pretty much just want to tell you that um, whenever you override a method you have to take the same arguments and same return types there I said it. I just said it in like three minutes the other time so let's go back to our fatty class right here and let me uh, refresh your memories we know we can do something like reference have a tuna reference and set tuna object equal to um, like new tuna and as you know this is the tuna reference right here and this is the tuna object and we can do this since tuna is a tuna and we can also do something like food food object equals new tuna and we can do this because tuna is a food and those are the things we learned in the last tutorials but what have we not seen so far what we haven't seen so far is food food object equals new food huh what about that well this is a problem for many reasons. Tuna and pot pie we wouldn't have a problem with and this is because when we put variables in here like color, shape, tuna has a color, tuna has a shape, pot pie has a color, pot pie has a shape. Food is too general. It doesn't really have a color. It says what color is food? I don't know. What shape is food? I don't know. And if you say alright I can eat a tuna I can eat a pot pie but I can't eat a food food is really too general and I know that there might be some exceptions to this but for the sake of programming there are some classes that are just too general that you don't want to create objects on in this food class is one example so if we had a food class we wouldn't want to give it any variables like color 
or a shape because food in general doesn't really have a color or shape so alright that's nice and all I kinda knew that already Bucky so why are you telling me this I mean I'm not giving you guys a tutorial to tell you guys that tuna has a color but what I am giving you guys teaching you guys it says in even though we can't create food objects like right here we need this food class still for inheritance and polymorphism but when we create this class we want to make sure other programmers um, can't create food objects either so how can we make this food class right here and, and how can we kind of bulletproof it to make sure that no one creates an object and they only use this class for inheritance and polymorphism and stuff like that well luckily the cool people who invented Java gave us this keyword and it's called abstract and how you make a class ab abstract is type a b s t r a c t abstract right before the class and what this does is mean alright you can use this class right here the class of food but you can't create any objects from it oh yeah wanna bet look at this food food object equals new food object right there oh I did it oh look I got an error I guess Bucky is right I can't instantiate the type food and that pretty much means you can't create an object anymore so if we take that abstract away look at this the error it goes away and now we can create an object so again what abstract means is that you can't create an object from that class but you can use that class from for things such as inheritance and polymorphism and stuff like that and that is so when you have a broad class that you only want to use for those kind of things then it kind of bulletproofs your programming and in the next tutorial we're going to be going over the two different types of classes abstract we went over in concrete and I'm going to be showing you guys an example of why it is useful and also what abstract methods are so this next couple tutorials is more of general ideas and then we're going to be building programs to use these ideas and put them to use use them and put them to use did I say that right? Hey, good enough but uh, thank you guys for watching hopefully you guys understand that um, anytime you override a method you need to take the same arguments and also the beginning of what an abstract method in excuse me abstract class is so again Thank you guys for watching. Please check out my next tutorial, and I will see you next time. Oh, by the way, don't forget to subscribe. Alright guys, welcome to your 58th Java tutorial. And in this tutorial, I'm going to be talking about the two types of classes. And in case you didn't already know, we already talked about the two types of classes. I just didn't tell you the uh, technical definitions of them. Now, you guys already know what an abstract class is from the last tutorial. Might as well put that back there so an abstract class it is a class that you can't create objects from so it's only useful for polymorphism and inheritance and stuff like that in these other classes that aren't abstract even though they don't have a name people call these classes concrete and the concrete class is a class that's specific enough where you can make an objects or excuse me you can make an object from it so even though it doesn't say concrete, that's what people call it, just because they have to call it, um, they just don't want to be like not abstract. So again, food, you wouldn't want to create something because it's too broad a topic, but tuna and pot pie, those are pretty specific, aka concrete. So you can create objects from concrete classes, but not abstract. So again, let me demonstrate this by saying, all right, whenever we try to create a food object, it's too broad and abstract, so it gets an error. But if we go ahead and create, we can, again, we can have this food reference, but if we create it from the class like new tuna, since this isn't abstract, we don't get, um, well, if I got rid of that, then we wouldn't get an error right here because tuna has no restrictions. We can create objects from this. Now, let's get rid of this and move on to our next topic. And so, you know what an abstract class is. And it pretty much is useless unless you extend it or it's inherited from something. And as you can see, tuna inherits food and pot pie inherits food. If nothing inherited food, it'll be useless because you can't create objects from it. 
So that's what an abstract class is. But just to make things more confusing, I want to tell you that methods can be abstract too. And what exactly is an abstract method? Well, an abstract method is a method that must be overwritten. So for example, we created this method in food. And since tuna and pot pie inherited food, we created a method eat in tuna and a method eat in pot pie, and both of these overwrote food. I mean, this wasn't necessary that we created these methods, but we did it anyways just for fun. So again, an abstract method is a method that must be overridden. In a sense, it must be overwritten, which means you need to create a body for it. Then this body in the main food class right here, this is unnecessary whenever you're creating an abstract method. So let's go ahead and create an abstract method right here. Let's go ahead and get rid of everything in our food class. How would we create an abstract method? Pretty much the only thing you need to do is add the head and a semicolon. So do public, we'll make it public, abstract, since it's an abstract method, void eat. Since it doesn't return anything and it's named eat. And now you can see this is a method, but it doesn't have a body. And if you're saying, all right, I never created a method without a body. Well, since tuna needs to overwrite it, pretty much it needs to create a body for it and pot pie needs to create a body for it as well then that is why um, in your declaration right here you don't need a body right here so again um, an abstract method in your superclass it doesn't need a body so another thing I want to point out anytime you have an abstract method in a superclass that entire class needs to be labeled abstract too right there so you can't have like um, an abstract method and you can't have this class be not abstract or else you're gonna get an error like that so every someone's knocking on my door I think hold on oh I'll let them keep knocking I'll get it after this tutorial and another thing I wanna point out is when we declared this public remember I said I can't change the scope when we override it so we need to make these public as well so we'll make that public and if you see that little error right here um, multiple markers can't reduce the visibility that is why anytime you see an error with the word visibility you probably need to change public to private or private to public or add one or the other so again like I was saying anytime you have an abstract method you need to make the class abstract too but here's the thing you can have an abstract class but have abstract or non abstract methods inside it so again in this is a uh, we're getting error because of something else here um, because anytime you have a non abstract method you need a body but anyways I just wanted to point that out um, anytime you have an abstract method you, it needs to be inside an abstract class but anytime you have a non abstract method it can be inside an abstract class well you just heard it. I don't need to repeat myself so the last thing I need to point out is let's go ahead and make this method abstract again just like this anytime you have an abstract method you need to implement it in one or excuse me in any of the subclasses that extends to the superclass now I know that sounds confusing but listen to this alright this tuna class and this pot pie class both inherit from this main food class in this food class has an abstract method of eat in it that means this tuna class and this pot pie subclass they both need to use the eat method or or in other words they both need to implement or override this eat method if you don't have this eat method then you're gonna get an error in your class just like this type pot pie must implement the inherited abstract method food dot eat so again anytime you have an abstract method in a superclass then the subclasses need to override that method and that's like making a promise this food says alright you want to inherit from me okay I'll let you but I'm telling you I have this abstract method and if you inherit from me you're gonna need to override it and Popeye's like 
All right, I promise I'll override it. Since you have an abstract method, I promise if you let me inherit from you, I will override it for you. So if like the classes could talk to each other, that's kind of the conversation they would be having. And if you're saying, all right, if I need to override this method anyways, what's the point of even having it in here? Well, it's pretty much for consistency and some polymorphism. And I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but in the next tutorial, I'm going to be building a program to demonstrate everything I went over in the last two tutorials. These last two tutorials were pretty much the rules and concepts that you have to follow. And I couldn't just skip over it because it's incredibly important um, for what we're going to be learning in the next, next couple of tutorials. And this is pretty much the core of polymorphism, these rules. So in like five tutorials ago when I called a class, or excuse me, it was an interface and I implemented it, that's what implemented means. Implement means pretty much you need to override the abstract methods. So that's enough for this tutorial. I probably should go uh, see who's knocking on my door. But thank you guys for watching. Um, don't forget to subscribe. Oh, I got like phlegm building up in my throat. But anyways, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next tutorial. What is going on guys? Welcome to your 59th Java tutorial. And if you've been watching the last couple of tutorials, then we pretty much learned all the really basic concepts of polymorphism and inheritance and stuff like that. So in this tutorial, we're going to be putting all our knowledge to use and building a program that pretty much gets a class and puts objects in an array. And it sounds confusing, but um, you're going to see what it is eventually. But before I uh, get into programming, I want to show you guys that I got rid of all my other classes because I'm going to need um, a better example and I thought that this would clearly um, or better demonstrate. So I made a new dog class and I made a new class called fish and the, I made a new class called animal. And since dog is an animal and fish is an animal, then I had them both extends or inherit from the class animal. And um, I didn't want to do that just because it took time. but I pretty much just made these classes and I have nothing inside of them. So if you want to go ahead and do that, you can follow along with me. So then, here's a scenario. We made these three classes called Dog, Fish, and Animal. And our boss comes in and he's like, alright, Bucky, I need you to program something for me. And I'm like, what is He's like, I need you to make a new class called, mm, we'll name it Dog List or something like that. And in this class, I want you to have an array that we can add dog objects. So like I said, an array can hold many things. It can hold numbers. It can hold strings. It can also hold objects. And this comes into use, um, well, we're going to be finding out why a little later. But in this tutorial, we're going to be building a new class and a new array to hold dog objects. Why? Because our boss told us to. So let's go ahead and do it. The first thing I want you to do is go ahead and under your package, under your source, right click it and click a new class. I know you probably can't see it, so I will move it down. Source, new, wow, now you really can't see it. But anyways, if you click a new and class, you get this thing that pops up. And just go ahead and put dog list or something like that. And now, let me move this back, so there we go. Now we have let's see one two three four five classes and we have this new dog list class and in this class we're going to be building an array to hold objects from this dog class and the fact that it extends animal is irrelevant for now so we have this dog list class and our boss wants us to build an array so let's go ahead and do that first let's go ahead and make it private because no need to make it public dog and we're putting dog and we'll name the array the list and we'll set this equal to new dog with parameter of five or an array length of five and we put this dog and dog even though we named the array the list we put dog and dog right here because that is what objects it's going to be holding it's going to be holding stuff from the dog class so now that we have an array name main list Let's go ahead and the only other thing we're going to need um, to work with our array is a counting variable. So let's go ahead and name private i equals zero. You can um, set equal to x if you feel more comfortable with that, but what's this error saying right here? 
Um, all right, we need an int. Private int i equals zero. So now we have an integer that's just a counting variable that's gonna help us work with our array. So now let's go ahead and build a new method to add dog objects. So again, or not again, we need um, a method named public void, we'll name it add. You can name yours whatever you want, I'm just gonna name it add because it makes sense. And as a parameter, whenever we call this, it's gonna take a dog object and we'll name it D for now, short and sweet. And the first thing we want to do in this method is do an if statement. So let's go ahead and make if, and we'll put i, which is our counting variable that's zero now, is less than the list dot length. And what this pretty much does is check if your array is full or not. So if i, the counting variable, is greater than five, then your array is already full. So it would just, I mean, the method would run, but it wouldn't add another one to array because this can only take five elements. So if it were seven and we tried to add one, then it wouldn't do anything. So if it is less than length, which means if it still has room in our array, what do we want to do? Well, the first thing that we want to do is put the list in i, which would be zero now, and we want to set it equal to d. So we're pretty much just going to loop through the array, and every time we call this method, add an object to that array element. Then just give us a little um, system out print line on the screen, something that says like dog added at index space, and we'll put i right there. Come on, come on, there we go. And we'll just, looks good right now. So now we have just a little um, something on our screen that we can see visually because, you know, we want some feedback here. So next, we'll just increment through i. So here's what this method is doing. It pretty much checks if your array is full or not. If not, it adds that object at that index. And then it says, just gives us a little message on the screen. And then it goes to the next counter so we don't keep adding it in the same index in our array. So now we built this class, just like our boss said, that has an array named the list. And it's going to loop through. And every time you call this method, it's going to add a new object to the array. So let's go ahead and do this in our um, main method. I named mine apples. I don't know why, but I did. So now let's go ahead and make a dog list object. So let's go ahead and put dog list. Uh, I'm going to name my DLO. You can name your object anything you want. And then you just put equals new dog list. So yours should look the exact same as mine, except if you didn't want to name it DLO, you don't gotta. So now we can go ahead and create a dog object, because I mean, we need one as our parameter. So we create dog D, or if you don't have a dog class, then uh, whatever you have. And we'll set it equal to new dog object, just like that. It doesn't take any parameters, because it doesn't even have any constructors or anything. Now what we have to do is pretty much call the method in our dog list. So we'll use that object, DLO, whoa, embarrassing. DLO, that's where I meant to type it. And we have a method called add in there. Remember, that's what our method was called. And it takes a parameter of an object, a dog object. And we have a dog object right here, dog D. So let's go ahead and put D as our parameter right there. And that's it pretty much. Just run this baby, click OK. And now, if everything goes right, it should say dog added at index 0. And if we added another one, it would say dog added at index 1, and it would go 2, 3, 4. And it would go all the way, um, and that is because we set this equal to a length of 5, which means index 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that's your real basic tutorial on our how to create an array to add objects into it. But then, what if our boss comes in and says, yeah, come in, boss. Hey, Bucky, I got a little problem. What's that, boss? All right, you know how I told you to create a dog list to hold dog elements? Or, excuse me, dog objects? Well, now, um, the people we're working for, they said, all right, I want it to hold fish elements, too. So how are we going to fix this problem? Well, that is a problem for the next tutorial, and that's what we're going to be doing. And trust me, you don't just add another um, entire class called fish. What we're going to do is making this bigger and better and 
you know it's just gonna be awesome and you're gonna learn a lot in the next tutorial so thank you guys for watching and another thing um my 500th video that I add I have like 491 my 500th video is gonna be the best video and the biggest surprise for you guys ever so you do not want to miss this 500th video it's probably being released this weekend but it is gonna be incredibly awesome and trust me you guys are definitely gonna want to see it so for now thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next tutorial what is going on guys welcome to my 60th job tutorial and in the last tutorial we went ahead and we built a new array and in essence we built a whole new class to uh, create this array to hold dog objects but then at the end of the tutorial got a little knock on our door and our boss was like alright you know how you created that for dogs well actually I need you to create one for fish as well and you know that's nice and all so what can we do what are our options we can go ahead and create a new fish list and do this all again or you know then we're gonna have if he comes back again and tells us to do it with dolphins or cats we're gonna have to keep doing that again and again and again so instead of just having to create class after class after class I wish there was a way where we can only create one class and it could hold fish objects and dog objects and any kind of animal that we want so then when our boss says alright I need you to actually create one to hold um, birds we're gonna be like oh you know what already done because we already built a sufficient and effective program to hold all classes of animals even the ones that we didn't even know um, that were created yet so how would we do that well this dog list is nice but let's go ahead and delete that right now delete and okay so instead of just creating a bunch of different classes to hold objects, let's go ahead and make one final thing, and we're going to name it Animal List. So let's go ahead and we can delete everything out of our main apples, or whatever your main uh, method is. And now, let me get rid of that error. And now let's go ahead and create a new class by right-clicking Source, New, Class. And we'll go ahead and name this Animal List. And this is going to be um, pretty much, let me run this, this little X is annoying me, there we go. And this is pretty much going to be um, the class that has our array to hold any type of animal, whether it be dog, fish, if you decide to create a dolphin class later, if you decide to create a hermit class later, it's going to already um, be able to hold that. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is create an array to hold type animals. And remember, these dog, fish, since they ins extend animals, all of these are type animals already. So let's go ahead and put private um, animal. I didn't, yep, animal. And we'll just name it the list equals new animal 5. So what this pretty much means is we created array, an array named the list and they can hold five objects of type animal right there so after this let's just go ahead and make our counting variable private i equals zero and now we can go ahead and build i always do that int i equals zero and now we can go ahead and build our method and that's public void void we'll name it add still but we have to spell void right add and we'll put animal a so now it takes one parameter which is an animal object and now we'll just do that test again if um, what do we name it the list or actually we want to do if i is less than the length if i is less than the list dot length so it would be um, five in this case but just in case you change this then you won't have to change it each time so that's why I'm doing that so if i is less than the list length what do we want to do let's go ahead and do exact same thing we did last time the list the index for that which would be i so at first when I would assign the list zero set it equal to a which is the animal object next let's just give us a little prompt on the screen like system out print line and we'll just have animal added at index space plus i 
So this pretty much just gives you a little message on the screen. And the last thing we want to do is increment i because if we don't, it's just going to keep adding to that same index over and over again. So each time this runs, it's going to change that counter variable that allows us to move to the next element in our array. So now that we got this animal list, it's going to take any animal object we have. And let's go ahead and I'll show you guys that right now. So in your main class, uh, whatever you named it, I named mine apples, still don't know why. We can go ahead and create an animal list object from this animal list we just created. So let's go ahead and put animal list alo, you can name it whatever you want, new animal list bam, just like that. Now let's go, go ahead and create a new dog object because remember that method takes a, um, an animal object as its parameter. So go ahead and actually you know what I'll do, I'll create a new dog, dog object and a new fish object. So dog, we'll just name it D because it's short and sweet. Equals new dog, just like that. Then I'll put fish from our fish class. Create an object from here. F equals new fish, like that. Now we can go ahead and call the add method in our alo dot add. First of all, we'll add that dog, and now we'll do alo dot add, and now we'll add that fish object. So now if we go ahead and run this, you can see, all right, animal added at index one, this is the dog object, and animal added, at, or excuse me, animal added at index zero, this is the dog object, and animal added at index one, that's the fish object right there. So again, what we did, real quick overview, we created an object so we can use the methods from this animal list class. We created two objects of dog and fish, which were both animal type, and we go ahead and we just called the add method so it first added that dog element to index 0 and add the fish element to index 1 and we can call that five times and then that's it then our array is full if we call it after that then it's just gonna it's gonna run the program but it's not gonna add it to our array because it's already full so this is a much smarter array than we built last time because now if someone wants to create a new class that was like hermit crab like I said before all they need to do is put extends animal and it's automatically an animal type so that way we don't have to create a new array for dog fish hermit crab dolphin um, gopher woodchuck beavers we just needed to create this one class right here and it took care of all those problems so if you think this array is pretty smart just wait to the next tutorial we're going to build this computer program even smarter and better than this. And if you didn't think that is possible, then trust me. Just wait till my next tutorial. And one other thing, and I know you've heard me before if you watched my last tutorial, my 500th video is going to be amazing. And it's going to benefit no one but you guys. So, um, a couple of you people might already know what that means, what I'm hinting at. But trust me, it's going to be the best video for you guys ever. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next tutorial.